The perfect karmic profession. It's, it's almost kind of magic. Oh wow, that's a good question. You can't be honest. Man, that's so expensive. I don't know, too expensive. They don't always come up that often, but when they do, grab them with both hands and just throw everything at it. Hello and welcome to the Tom Hutch Podcast, where I interview individuals who have made a successful career within the music industry to find out how they got to where they are and any tips or advice that they have for musicians at any level and any stage of their own careers. My guest on this episode is Steve Pearce who's one of the most experienced bass players working in London today. Most recently, he held the bass chair in the West End for the Carol King musical Beautiful and plays regularly on sessions in the top London studios. Over the course of his career, he's played with the likes of Van Morrison, Stevie Wonder, Tom Jones, Al Jarreau, Brian Ferry, Madonna, Mark Knopfler, Seal, Randy Crawford and many, many more. His TV work also includes being in the house band for shows such as Sports Personality of the Year, Proms in the Park the Royal Variety Show, and tons more. In this episode, we talk about the skills needed to work in studio sessions, grafting and serving your talent, the experience of working with household names, the importance of doubling on your instrument, and much more. Steve has a lot of stories from his career and has been working consistently at the top of the industry for decades, and you're about to hear why, so please enjoy this conversation with Steve Pearce. Where did you grow up? Were you London-based? No, I I grew up in Hitchin in Hertfordshire, which is about... Uh, 30 miles from here and my dad was a piano player and when I was 14 he I asked to play an in, if I could play an instrument and I, apparently I wanted to play the drums I don't remember that <laughs> but he thought oh no drums in my house no <laughs> why, don't, why don't you play the bass and then you can come out and work with me because right. he did like primarily did uh, little dance band gigs and weddings and little you know functions on a Friday and Saturday night, pub gigs and stuff. Yeah. Um, so by the time I was 15, I was out playing with him, uh, learning standards, jazz standards. He put a piece of music in front of me on the first day that I bought, he bought me a bass guitar. Mm. So I knew what a crotchet was and I knew where B flat was on the stave from day one. Right, so learning to read straight away. Well, yes, and that is the greatest gift. In, t- in terms of how it's helped me make a living although maybe I would have done something else music tends to f- put you where you deserve to go it's a p- perfect karmic profession as far as I'm concerned really? I think so if, if you put whatever you put in will come back to you I've, uh, I, it's, it's almost kind of magic really because that's what I've found Right. If you try hard and you and you want to do something and you you go into that area and learn it and and give respect for the music, it will come back to you and you'll find yourself well all over the world and doing whatever really. Right. Not always straight away, just at some. No, point. no. I mean, I think if you push it, you you don't push the universe because it will right. just push back twice as hard. You know. Yeah. So it's really hard when you're young because you you you're. you're you're anything but cool, are you? You're sort of like, come on, I want it now. I want. It. I can do that. I can do that. Why is he doing that? I should be doing that. You know, there's yeah. all those things going on in your mind. Um, but um, I think it will come to you if you keep working at it. You know, mm. that's my motto anyway. Yeah, well, that's probably a good way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. I find it's funny because you're the third person that in about two days I had this conversation with. Really? Two da- two ago, I did a little g- a pub gig down in um, in uh, Kingston called Boaters. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really nice gig on the river. Jazz, they'd have jazz and funk and R and B little live bands. It's usually a quartet, sometimes a quintet, and I do that every now and again. And t- and somebody bought their son along. who was sixteen, bass player. And I had that very conversation with him because right. everybody wants to know what to do and how to get on, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, when I was fifteen, you could be not very good and go and play with your dad playing, you know, tunes and stuff, mm. um, and make some money because there were gigs like that around then, you know. Uh, so it was kind of um, learn as you earn, 
which was really, which is why I've never done anything else. I've only ever been a musician. Right. So from the age of fifteen, just straight onwards. Yeah. All, all that's the right. I left there. school in the fir- uh, Easter in the A levels because I was basically earning. It wasn't suiting me going to school, the discipline <laughs> of going to school, and then going out Fridays and Saturdays with my dad and being an adult. Right. At fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. And um, did your parents support you in doing that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, my dad was knocked out, you know. Right. Great. Just, uh, and um, so I did that. And then, of course, there was lots of work around then. Uh, not studio work. Well, I didn't ever think about it, although that's what I always wanted to do. I always wanted to be a studio musician. Um, but I didn't push that either. I kept... Um, you know, kept my ears open and learning, reading about studio musicians. There weren't, there was only one college you could go to, which was Leeds at that time. Oh, really? Um, that did bass guitar. I mean, no Gildor wouldn't have even let a bass guitar through the door in what, 1975. You know, yeah. no. I mean, they all, they, they, they have fine, fine, fine things. I mean, you couldn't do it. There was no such thing as a jazz course in, right. at Trinity or, or the Academy or whatever, you know. There was only this place in in Leeds, and I and I didn't fancy going there because I was working already. And being in Hitchin, you could drive to London, do a gig, and drive home. You know, I mean, yeah. it, was, it was commutable. So, and I lived at home, so there's no problem at all. Um, just kept getting gigs and doing everything I could, playing. Um, so, what what was your was there like a first moment when after your doing all your gigs with your dad and everything yeah. that you started doing gigs with someone else uh, well, well funny enough when I was 17 I did uh, I got two jobs uh, first job was with my dad in a hotel in Wembley six nights a week um, I was 17 yeah just I was you know, nearly 18 um, and we used to do we used to play a little set it was a quartet played a little set for people eating, and then there was a cabaret. It was like a cabaret club, right. you know. Um, <clears throat> and we used to get on a Monday. We'd have the Monday afternoon rehearsal, and we'd rehearse the cabaret. Right. And then we'd do the evening um, sort of little things. My dad used to write out nice little funky things for a quartet. So I was reading things, you know, testing myself that way. So you're getting both things, you're getting the reading exactly. and the jazz. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and the chord symbols. So I was kind of, he wrote out, when when I started working, he wrote out 600 standards for me in a book. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, he. I can't emphasise what great support he was, really, because, I mean, that, you know, the real, you couldn't buy a real book then. Mm. Um, so that was his his chords that would, they stood, stood me in great stead. And then I... What happened was he was busy elsewhere, so with the little the six night a week residency, he'd put piano players in. So I play get to play with other people. They'd bring a little pad in, and I'd get to sight read that. Right. Um, the drummer worked with the BBC Radio Orchestra, and the guitar player was in the BBC Radio Big Band, and very good, really good players, good, much better sight readers than me or my dad, and were session people. They played, right. they did studio work, which is what I wanted. Oh. And a drummer called Kenny Hollick, um, older guy, lovely, lovely guy, great player, real old professional kind of good little funky player. He, I used to drive from Hitchin to him, his house in Bushy, and it, we used he used to take me to studios to, and all over London, and right. I used to sit there and watch. And I met people that I still know today, uh, who I've worked with for years and years now, yeah. always remember me as the kid that used to sit in the corner with headphones on, drinking it all in. Really? So in terms of, I made my own college course up, if you if you know what I mean, because mm. there was no such thing as studio, you know, you didn't, you go well, to college now. Doubt there is really, at the moment, I mean, do you, you, is there courses? Well, if you go to like ACM or somewhere, one of those those places, they have modules where you get to play in a studio and, yeah. You know, you learn about that, but uh, my time in my time, nobody that was like a, a complete elite mm. thing. Studio musicians didn't do West End shows, didn't do jazz. Well, they did jazz gigs, but they didn't do sort of sort of function gigs. Yeah, they just did studio work. So, so they were like pure session yeah, musicians. Yeah, I mean, they were the absolute cream of the business because it, it the best players did that. Right. And um, there was lots of studio work around, and so. 
I could, I saw a chance I could break into that if I got my sight reading skills up and got my, and learnt the experience. And so I used to go around to the studios with Kenny and then I started going to BBC Made of Ale Studios, which is still there. And at that time, there were six studios. Studio One was where the BBC Symphony Orchestra was based. Studio Two was like a very live, ambient one where they had like choral works recorded. Studio Three was where the Radio Big Band were recorded every day. Uh, they had this is when they had staff orchestras. Uh, studio four and five were little tiny studios where they did all the John Peel sessions and the rock and roll sessions and right. and studio six was where the radio or orchestra was which is a, a, the strings and a rhythm section and I used to go down there and I used to go from studio to studio they all knew me as this kid <laughs> that, this kid who, who was keen mad keen and I'd hung out in that I used to go whenever I could go down there, right. sit next to the bass player in the, in the uh, radio orchestra, learn how to follow a conductor because I had no experience of that at all because I didn't go to college. Yeah. So I kind of learned that. I learned how to how to leave watching him play, and how his experience got him round things that were tricky or following a stick where they, where you're playing with a string section that are a mile behind. And you would learn where the bounce on the you know the stick is and all those things. And I I, I encountered some incredibly kind older musicians because I was respectful and I had sort of grace sitting there and I wasn't a pain in the ass and um, and I learned all my stuff from that. So mm. by the time I got did my first session, which actually was before then, but I had some skills um, that you know, were valuable yeah. for later on when I did start getting booked on big things. You yeah. Know. So was it like you got your first session and then you were like, wow, I love this. So then you were like, I want more of this and you went and yeah. started sitting in. I think I think it was, my, but also maybe it was a reaction to the fact that my dad never was a studio musician because he didn't really sight read well enough. Um, uh, so, and I, he, it was almost like I was, living vicariously through him but it's like I wanted to be that I always wanted to be the best at that at right. being a freelance professional musician and that I always saw it that these guys walked in and they were happening players and, mm. and could read everything and you know so it's that's what all that's just what always appealed to me so I that's what my goal was really um and when did you was that like 15 or did you, was that 17 when you uh, well, the thing is, I knew at 15, I met, all I wanted to do was meet, bet, play with better drummers, because the right. drummers I started playing with in these like little dinner dance function gigs, yeah. were pretty, some of them were pretty terrible, you know, <laughs> but then I'd meet, my dad and me had, uh, well, I've got, uh, my record collection is, when he died, when I left home, we had to split our record collection up, because we had this fantastic record collection at home. And we listened to Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, big band stuff. Um, so he was, and we used to listen to music on the way to gigs, all the way from Hitchin to God knows where. Um, and so we learned about music together, so it, and it was an amazing thing. And we used to take, he had, we used to do lots of lots of little trio gigs, and we used to have various drummers, and we we were into kind of Herbie Hancock and um, funk stuff really and he used to write things out and, and torture these poor drummers he, <laughs> all they wanted to do was play a waltz and a few bits of brushes you know what I mean yeah. and uh, my dad was writing out a Steve Gadlick from a Dear Darto album or something <laughs> and, and going what oh, Ian I, I don't think I can play this I don't want and, they, and you could see him like sweating but it was great you know <laughs> but so uh, and then I met a few, a few other good drummers uh, who came in and uh uh, played in my dad's trio because he had a nice little gig out up in Cambridge in a hotel motel on a Friday and Saturday. And the drummer who started doing that was a guy called Robin Jones, who's um, a percussion player, actually, a great percussion player. He's still around. He's about 87 or something ridiculous. And he played really nice drums. And he used to started putting depths in that were really good. And one person he put in was a guy called Alan Ganley. Do you remember Alan Ganley? No, I don't think okay, so. Okay, he's an old jazz guy who played with Tubby Hayes, a fantastic player, great big band arranger. And he 
emig- he went and emigrated to Bermuda. And he came after many years, and then he came back and he didn't have any work. So he put, uh, he ended up doing all sorts of things that he would never have done before. And Robin put him, Robin Jones put him in as a depth for him. Right. And he turned up, and that week I bought a Jim Hall album with Ron Carter, Art Farmer, um, who else? Tommy Flanagan, all, all sorts of people. Michael Brecker was on it. Um, and Alan Ganley was on drums because he was an old friend in Bermuda of Jim Hall. Right. Good jazz guitar player. So I went to the gig and I was shitting myself. And I was 16, I thought, 16, I was 16. And uh, at the end of the gig, he said, Steve, he said, You've got a fantastic time. Keep at it, keep working. And it, it was like amazing for me. You know? mm. It was a, a real fantastic experience that someone who I've got an album with who's playing drums on takes the trouble to say that to me, you know. Yeah. And that was a confidence boost and that kind of pushed me. Forward. and I ended up playing with him a few times after that in uh, uh, so that was kind of a yeah it must have been amazing yeah this is, what I'm talking about is like the slow ascent yeah. of my career <laughs> things that happen to you you know and then you start getting little calls and people go oh he's good oh he's good and, and mm. you, yeah, I ended up just doing all sorts of things really you know um, I did my fair share of really terrible functions man bar mitzvahs Jewish weddings they weren't my daughter's a singer and she does a higher level function band and I've seen it and it's fantastic. Right. And I did five years of it and they were terrible, <laughs> really terrible, terrible old mesos who didn't give a shit. We, didn't, we did like a horrible pop set at the end that all the old guys didn't want to play. Mm. And early on, no, there, were no, there was no music. All you did was, the, you know, uh, people were holding, two, putting two fingers down means B flat, yeah. in we go. Bossa Nova, we do like half an hour of Bossa Novas with, pick, with trumpet players going D, D minor, and you'd have to know it. So it was like amazing right. grounding. But really, as far as quality of music was concerned, it was awful. <laughs> I couldn't stand it. I, couldn't, I mean, I couldn't wait to, to get out, out of it. Anyway, I started doing a few sessions, and the people I met, they'd have little side sessions, you know, bits and pieces. Uh, so I started learning that sort of thing, and um, then I moved to London, nineteen eighty, um, and I got then I got my name was kind of being banded about as sort of a young bass player. I was about twenty two, I think, and I got phoned by a top session fixer called Sid Sachs, right. um, very famous old guy, funny very funny little Jewish fiddle, great, fantastic fiddle player. He used to fix all of the film sessions and everything. And he, I did an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical called Song and Dance because they wanted a young band, right? a good young band. And Sid used to fix Andrew Lloyd Webber's sessions. So he said, I want Sid to f- fix a fear. So I ended up doing that, um, which was good. Made an album with that, with the, of the cast of that. And then I met, the MD Harry Harry Rabinovitz, who I went on to work with in on film sessions and TV shows. He was the MD there. The guy who took over from him, Kenny Clayton, I ended up doing loads of sessions for him. So right. you see what I mean? The piano player uh, Fee Trench, who um, arranged the strings for the Van Morrison albums that I played on. I used to do loads of uh, disco hit sessions for him. Right. That's my first session. So, like 1982, that was. I did the show. I only lasted three months. I couldn't stand the repetition of doing eight shows a week. Really, it drove my it drove me round the bend at 22, mm. and I lasted three months. And then I went off and did. I, I'd rather do dodgy weddings than sit in a pit. You know, this really? I'm going to. The, the, it all changes later in life. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But uh, so I went off and did that, and then started doing some sessions and thinking, yeah, this is good, this is good, this is good. And then the real change uh, happened on the day of Live Aid, right, which is July the 13th, 1985, because uh, I was living in Hendon in a little, in a little rented flat and I had a, tor- a terrible Jewish wedding or something that night. And my girlfriend, now my wife, Went, had a ticket to go to Live Aid at Wembley. So I said cheerio to her. She goes off 
I'm in my dressing gown, I put the telly on, status quo come on, start playing, rocking all over the world. And uh, I thought, I'm not doing this gig. I'm not going to do those gigs anymore. I right. can't stand this. I can't, I've got to do something else. Uh, so I spent all day on the phone trying to get a, a depth for the gig. Really? Yeah. Right, yeah. So it was a I mental got, switch. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, the, just... the vibe was so, you, were you born then, 1985? No. Right, okay. Well, the, I mean, to be around for that in the going on in the world was just immense. What it was, you know, it was a, I mean, you're, you're used to kind of benefit concerts now um, of huge stature, but that was the first one and it was like, fucking nice. amazing. Yeah. And I was nailed, completely nailed to the floor and I thought, I can't, I can't do shit work it. I can't do this shit anymore. I've got to, get down to some work and practice and get myself in to another level right otherwise I'll just be turning up to some fucking function suite and playing terrible music with old geezers all my life you know what I mean anyway so I did I stopped yeah and um, yeah that coincided that was about that's 1985 and 1986 I started working for um a session fixing company called UK Orchestras who were really, really successful for a small time. And I did some en enormous sessions, film sessions, TV sessions, record sessions, orchestral, you know. And, yeah. and, and the reputation that I, I gained from doing that comes, continues to this day. That's I always think of that. Sounds kind of like a jumping off point. Yeah, almost. 1986, I th that's when I considered okay. I'd reached my studio musician right. goal. So what did you do between 1985 when you mentally switched to then when right. you got that for like a year? Okay, well, th what did I do? Um, do you just not, not do as much work at all? And well, I was still that? started doing sessions by then because I, I, I'd actually started doing sessions, but I, I it was less to do with... I could actually afford not to do it, to be honest. Right. So, so that helps. Yeah, but well, that'd be obviously, you know, yeah. <laughs> you have to do something. You have to, I still had to pay the rent, but I was in a little poxy flat in Hendon. It was 150 quid a month or something. Mm. And yeah, uh, so I got by, you know. Um, yeah, because I think a lot of people, like the financial, especially in London, the financial element of it is such a big thing. Like yeah. these days as well, it's just like so expensive. It's mental. It but means... the function stuff, it seems to be the thing that, keeps people like afloat yep. when they first start out. And you know what? I went to do a masterclass down, a talk down in ACM in Guildford. And I spoke to the guy who runs the bass thing there and, it, and I said, I told him about doing functions and how much I hated him and that I hated functions. And he, and he said, you know that that's really like a really sought after thing to do now. Yeah. And I didn't really know because all I have is my experience of it. And as I say, now that my... I, but so, so I've seen my daughter's uh, function band. They're this amazing. I'd have loved to have done that. Yeah. I'd like to do that now. Well, Thank I God. think I think there is there is still like you're saying there is still the function stuff where you know you just turn up and it's a bit a bit like a slog. Right. Like, and I think I know a lot yeah. of people that I've done a lot of it myself as well. But yeah. then these days, like you're saying, there are there's kind of like a split. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Function bands are either like really on it. Yeah. And like. Well, I did. I mean, I did function bands that were the top function bands right. but they were just shocking and because it was all old people who just wanted to play wanted to do a quick step or a box draw or a bloody <laughs> waltz or something you know yeah. pop music was something that when they were all terribly pissed and you did like YMCA you know <laughs> you know what I mean so yeah, it was yeah. like all, it was, and the quality of it and my playing I was playing with drummers who didn't give a shit about pop music and I, I did give a shit about yeah. everything I give a shit about everything I play I try and find the music in whatever I, I'm put is put in front of me or I'm expected to play you know I mean that's probably the mentality of like session musician like, yeah gotta be yeah like, totally yeah. I mean the, mind you I mean there's, there's there's lots of session musicians um, who I've been in studio with who primarily like brass players I guess who don't like pop music but they're fantastic craftsmen at their at their at their craft, you know what I mean. So, so it's kind of more like a job. Yeah. In that genre. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but then they're not required to be creative in any way. They're just supposed to be, 
You know what I mean? They just Reed reproduce the what's on the yeah. chart brilliantly. We have the best session musicians in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. I've been in studios with them, and they're absolutely astonishing players. And, uh, and they, they'll go out and play jazz or whatever they want to play. Yeah. Some people don't. Some of them are fantastic jazz players, but don't ever go and play jazz. They just go and sit in the studio. Yeah. You know, it's so there's room for all sorts of personalities. But I'm in the rhythm section, and if you talk to any, I don't know who else you talk to, but you know, if, if you talk to Adam Goldsmith, he's he's fucking burning and in, enthusiastic and cares about his sound and his and you know reading and playing and listening to records I play in his band man I mean mm. it's, it's like wicked it's, yeah. you know we go and we go and do TV shows a Royal Variety show or whatever you know the sports person out of the year we sit in the orchestra and play Gary Lineker on <laughs> and piss ourselves laughing you know and then we'll go out and do a gig we went down to Southampton for 50 quid the, the other day really last last yeah, it was last summer but because we, we just wanted to said, come on, let's go out and play. Let's get a few gigs. And the saxophone player said, well, we could do uh, Southampton Jazz Club, but it pays £50 a head and you, you put the and then they put the hat round. And we went, oh, come on, let's go and do it, you know. Wow. So so there's like real enthusiasm goes on. And if and and that's, that's, in, that's like a massive part of it for you and everyone else yeah, involved. Yeah, in yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, I know people who don't do that, but I can always be asked to put my, my amp, amp in the car and go and play. Hmm. And sometimes I play for nothing. If if somebody asks me for a charity thing or whatever, if the music's there, I'll go and play anywhere. I've n- I've never lost that love. Forty two years later, I've right. never lost it. You know, um, and uh, I was playing double bass on a session for an Italian artist the other day, where somebody I've been playing doing sessions for for 30 years was the MD and we were telling stories of all sessions gone by and funny things you know hilarious things that have happened and all that and I and I love that as well you know I'm playing yeah. music that's written out for me and then the next night I go and play at Boaters with a girl girl singer who's fantastic girl singer and turns up with a sheet of chords and we made music out of you know, they're they're kind of pop tunes and stuff, uh, nice standards and all that, but we yeah. put a different spin on it. And it was massive, you know, I love that. That's two complete different ends of my what I can do. Yeah. But uh, you talk about making a living, that's what I have to do. I, I mean, right. I took up double bass in 1996, which is 20 years, tw- over 20 years after I started playing. Okay. And that's been a valuable string to my bow if you might, if I might say so you know I, I is, that, is that why you took it up because you were well I'll tell you what I was doing hole in... no, well there was that and there was a very fortuitous thing happened when I started playing it my a real good friend of mine Simon Gardner who's the lead trumpet on Strictly Come Dancing that bass in the corner there he inherited it in 1980 right from a guy a uh, family friend and it always been in his bedroom at his flat in Arnus Grove um, and I said to him I, I was doing Jesus Christ Superstar 1996 and so I, this is when I go back into the West End and okay. I, I have to get on with it because I did uh, chronologically 1986 you say about when I after Live Aid 1986 I got a show called Chess Right. in West End with uh, Mitch Dalton on guitar who I've known since I was 18 and Graham Ward on drums and we were paid a fortune to be the rhythm, ABBA's rhythm section there was the two guys from ABBA wrote chess yeah. with Tim Rice and uh, we had to audition and consequently we were we charged what we liked well, so <laughs> it, it was very very lucrative time then okay. so I went back into the West End then, then I didn't go in, then I didn't have to go in the West End from like 1988 I was so busy in the studio that was my real cream time right. I was doing Van Morrison Randy Crawford all, all loads of things loads mm. of loads of things it was a fantastic time you know? yeah yeah um, and then 90 sort of 1990 my daughter was born um, 1992 it, the work was pretty duff and I got in, I started doing Les Miserables in town, which right. every, if if you 
if you know the music, everybody said, how the hell can you play that music? <laughs> but I got my head down and it meant that I could be with my kids all day and then at six o'clock drive into the West End. Yeah. And I could be off whenever I like, which was really a fantastic thing. So I was not really there very often. It was a really good sort of diary so feeling. more like a kind of life. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Way, yeah. But... My wife didn't have to, have to work. She could be at home with the kids. I went and grafted, came home, took my kids to school, went to all the things. You know, it was a, it was really was very, very a nice time, really. Mm. And I mean, well, people of your age, West End shows are like gold dust to you lot, aren't they? You'd love one of those. Yeah, it's going that I mean? way now. Yeah, yeah man. No, well, I've just finished doing um, Beautiful, the Carol King oh, musical right, yeah. with Neil Wilkinson. Two and a half years of that, and it's that's fantastic. It was fantastic because it was all people of my age or or similar. So none of us want any grief. We we had a fixture who let us be off when more or less when we liked. Right. Uh, it was a fantastic band, and I know I realize, and it's worth a fortune a year. I mean, you, it's the probably the only way as a musician you can afford a mortgage and live in London if you do a show you know so, so it, like in terms of like steady yeah, work yeah. and like yeah, yeah. being lucrative enough yeah. to live off it yeah. it like you're saying these days definitely West End seems to be I mean it seems to from people I've talked to this is the impression seems to be that all the session stuff when that started kind of going less and less yep. almost yep. like all of the players kind of went from there to the, to the West, West End, End. Uh, I mean it, look, before my time you would not get a studio magician anywhere near a West End job nowhere near well like you said you did it for three months and then yeah yeah because they, they, nobody nobody could even comprehend and the, consequently the standard in the West End was really shit mm. and actually my, when I started in the West End in 1982 that was really that was a good band Really good band, and there were session players in it, so right. you could see the change happening. They offered better money, uh, and they enticed session players into the West End. And as you say, when the when the studio work, TV shows and stuff dropped off. Mm. Um, now all the people I see in the studios all do West End shows. Yeah, all of the Strictly come dancing lot, uh, not Trevor or Brett, but all the others all do West End shows mm. as well. So they'll kind of like they'll do the do the shows and then if they get sessions during the day they'll yeah, do them. And they it's will. Just like, yeah, yeah. So it, it one thing that like, a thread that seems to be coming out of everyone that I'm talking to as well is like people like yourself who do all the sessions and do the shows and everything like and people who are just like successful musicians like just don't seem to stop. It's just no. constant, yeah. <laughs> constant graph like you're saying. Yeah. Well, I, 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 the thing is, it's not for everyone, this business. Yeah. I say this to people all the time. And in fact, whenever there's somebody, a story comes out where, especially in the West End, where someone's gone fucking mad in between shows or something and got absolutely rat-arsed or someone, on a, uh, someone said the wrong thing on a session and they got rubbed out or... And it's like, I always just say, well, this business is not for everyone. You know? yeah. it's not, it doesn't suit everyone. And unless you love it, and you need, I always say, you don't, you, you don't do it because you want to, you do it because you need to mm. be a musician. And if you don't need to, you're not going to be one. Yeah. You know, like I'm going back, coming back to the karmic thing, right? If you need to do it, it will look after you. Uh, but if you go, oh, I can't be asked to do this, then... It won't be asked. The music business will not be asked, and yeah. you will not be a musician. Mm. So when you say about us grafting, we don't think of it like that. Yeah, I, I don't know what, what anybody else has said, but I, I mean, I work all hours of the day, and mm. I drive. Last a couple of two three weeks ago, I did a little tour with a guy. I play in Hamish Stewart's band. He used to mm. be the singer with the Average White Band. I've been in his band yeah. for twenty years. Never made any, not really any money, enough money, but uh, it's my hobby and I love it and it's my favourite ever funky gig. It's amazing. And I did a little three day tour with a friend of him from his from LA came over. And on two of those days, I got you at four o'clock in the morning, right. driving to Manchester and back, 
uh, and they end up being up to go and do a session the next morning. Yeah. Uh, then re- trying to recover, and then the next day. So my body clock's completely and utterly out of wherever. Mm. But I never once think of it as 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 work, you know. Yeah. I don't. I just don't. It's like if I want to if if I want to play the music I want to play, then that's just part of it. You have to drive to. Yeah. You know. I mean, I think one. I think I drove to Manchester, Manchester to Faversham in Kent, to Northampton, to Bournemouth. Right. In one week, you know. Yeah, yeah. Thinking, and it's just like, what, whatever. It's all right, yeah, it's fine, yeah. it's fine, you know. It's interesting that you say that, though, because I think when you first start out, like I'm kind of at that stage, where you start getting stuff further away or whatever, yeah, like functions yeah. or whatever. Um and then I'm sure other people do as well. I started thinking like, you know, will this keep going? Like, will I, will I still keep on to do this? And it's mm. interesting you saying that, like, that you do do it. And I mean, Adam Goldsmith said exactly the same thing. He was like, if you're not sure whether you want to be a musician or not, like, you're not going to be. No. Like, you have to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you're not at all. And it, make, it makes sense. Well, I, could, um, I said this to the person who brought his son to, to talk to me the other day. And I said... Because he, he said, did you always want to be a musician? And I said, when my dad bought me a bass at 14, the weight just came off my shoulders right. because I didn't have to think about what the fuck I was going to do. I, I could go into the O-levels, not really giving a shit. Um, um, A-levels, whatever, school, whatever. It was like, I'm going to do this. Like it's like, oh, focus, come on. It was like, and it was just like, I looked up and went, thank you. Because it's you know it's it's that's all I've ever wanted to do. So I'm still, uh, but in order you have to serve that. If if you're given the gift to be uh, to have be able to be musical, yeah, you have to serve your gift. That's that's the way I call it, call it. So this morning I'm playing double bass studies for you know not long but just playing. Yeah, and uh, you know I'll go and play some cello studies on bass guitar a bit later on and you know I'll, whatever it's, you have to just keep it going you know and I'll put a record on and clock, clock what is nice about the bass playing on that or whatever and use take that with me it doesn't sort of stop you know it's like yeah. what you're saying you don't just come out of college <laughs> perfectly formed do you you know yeah, yeah. I mean god there's so much to le- there's so much to learn from every bit any every music you ever go and listen to or mm. watch I mean I watch people play bass players play on YouTube or whatever whatever and I think oh that's interesting that just that you know especially double bass players you know right so you're still drawn to it you're still like trying to learn and yeah develop stuff well because and... the thing is I mean it's you can't you, you can never get it right can you you can get the note right but it's the feeling isn't it it's like yeah. if I was with my, my concept of bass is about length of note sound of note volume dynamic of note of the note um, where you place it where you don't place it it's like there's there's so many variables that and they're so um Governed by the drummer's bass drum sound, right. or how hard he hits the hi hat, or whether he hits it in the right place, or the keyboard player's in front and the guitar player's in behind, and you know that's four of you. It could be. Like, I mean, I, I I play this week. I'm doing uh, proms in the park at Hyde Park with a BBC concert orchestra. Mm. So here's here's the list of skills that I I have to I have to take with me. Uh, first of all, the first skill is trying to get into Abbey Road with my amplifier <laughs> for a 10.30 start and parking in the park car park at St John's Wood when I know that there is a Lord's Cricket match on. So I've got to get there early enough to get my car in. Right. I might not. So I've got to now know where the next place I'm going to go and park for a three-hour rehearsal, get my amp down into Studio One um, and then go and park the car, then come back. Then... I might start thinking about what I've got to play, which I don't know yet. I don't know what I've got to play. Jeez, I mean that is like that's one thing. Like when people say like, "Oh, you're a musician," like, "What do you do?" or whatever. Yeah. Like that's that's something 
you never think about it, do you? <laughs> no, like, people well, don't realise that there's, there's well, so let me, much... Let me tell you, when, when she phoned me, Claire at the, at the BBC phoned me and said, I think I might need bass guitar for Problems in the Park. I did it last year. I said, oh, great, OK. Uh, but I don't know, it might be double bass as well. Uh, OK. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, double bass in the park. I did the gig last... So I've been thinking about... This is Thursday morning. I've got to be at Abbey Road. We've got to rehearse sort of 10, yeah. 10.30 to one thirty. So I've, I'm not even thinking about the music because I can kind of take care of that when I get there. Yeah. And basically, I've been around long enough that if I can't play it within two minutes, then I'm not going to be able to play it. And really? It'll, I'll, right. it'll be all right. So it, you whatever. don't have to worry about the music. No, no, I don't. Like... I'm more worried about getting my fucking amp in there, <laughs> right? And then whether or not I can persuade Scotty, who's the BBC um, roadie, he, he drives the truck with all the instruments, and I've got to ask him nicely whether he'll take my amplifier to Hyde Park so that I can go on the tube like I did last year, which was just glorious. Right. And I mean, that, so all these things, because I, I, I had a result last year because I played with, uh, I don't know, Michael Ball and Alfie Bow and a few other people. Um, and then the main act was Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. And I, right. and I wasn't in that, so... While I was walking out with my bass on my back because I didn't have to take my amp because yeah. Scott took it back to the to the truck for me, and I was on the tube while Frankie Valley just came on, and I thought this is such a result. <laughs> and I'm sorry, it sounds really sort of flippant and blasé and all the rest of it, but you know what? The driving and the humping the gear and and the logistics is just the most nightmare thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, I do the Royal Variety Show every year, right? That is double bass and bass guitar, and a pedal board, and an amplifier. And it's always a pain in the ass. We did it, the Palladium, we did it two, week, two years running. So you have to drive into Great Marlborough Street and just hope for the best. Run in to the Palladium where they're setting up a massive TV show. Run in, try and find somewhere to put your double bass so that they, people don't knock it over, which has happened before. Right. And then run back and get your car. I mean, it's just an abs- absolute fucking nightmare. Yeah. Hammersmith Odeon we did, or Labatt's Apollo, or whatever it's called now, last year. Oh, my God. There were 30 coaches outside waiting for the punters. <laughs> and one of the missus who came to pick me up was arguing with a policewoman while I'm walking out with my double bass right. because I've got three trips to go. Anyway, it's enough about that. It's, it's the music, isn't it? It's the music, yeah. whatever. So, so uh, I, as I say, I don't know what I've got to play, yeah. but it's, it'll be all right. But it's an important point to make. Like, yeah. when, you're, when you're self-employed and you're yeah. doing stuff like that, like if you don't sort that out yourself, like that's, that's on you, right? Yeah. So oh, if, yeah. You, if you turn up late because you haven't found a parking spot or whatever... Like, it's, it's, listen, there's no such, there's no, it's nobody else's fault than yours if you're late yeah and you can't be late if you're in the rhythm section you can't be late if you you know if you can run down the road with a trumpet in your hand well then you're you're in a better place than me i've got no chance Mm. i'm always first always the first in uh, every session nobody ever gets me ian thomas my great friend if he's ever at a gig or a session before me He's, he can't believe it. He goes, I'm oh, fucking, I'll beat you, I'll beat you. <laughs> you know, it, it never, it very rarely happens right. in, in 30 years of us doing sessions together. It, it's, I'm always first, oh, always. Nice. Every, because I don't, I can't stand the thought of rushing around. I, I mean, I, you know, whenever I've done, I've had a West End show, like Adam's the opposite of me, Adam Goldsworth. He does everything. And I look at him and I go, what are you fucking doing, man? <laughs> you know, we'd be doing... We, we, we did Beautiful, the Carol King musical together. Mm. And we'd be, uh, I don't know, Angel, doing some really well-paid film session. Really, really well-paid. And it's like, finish at five, great, you know. And I always take the night off. I, I can't even entertain the idea of going into the West End after having a really expensive day in the studio I feel good about myself I'm doing what I want to do you know Adam he's off he's doing the show you know yeah I mean he's got a young family and he's he's I've never I've always had the mind that I know how much is enough for a week okay after if there's you know I could earn far more if I just but I'd rather come home, you know, and right. have sort of because otherwise I am all I'm doing is driving to Manchester and back, yeah. lacquering myself, 
you know, I used to do the late set at Ronnie's with Mark Fletcher's band, and that started at one thirty in the morning and finished at three in the in the morning. And I was doing the show as well, which finished at ten. God. So on a Friday night, I'd finish the show at ten and then go to Ronnie's and sleep in the band room for an hour, <laughs> wake up, have a cup of coffee, and then go and do. But it was because the music was so amazing, you know. Yeah. Um, but that was crazy. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, Adam was the last person I talked to oh, okay. about this, and he was saying that like it's the same way with anything. You know, if you look in your diary, I, I don't know what it's like with you, but um, he was saying like you know next two months you've got X Y Z, but you know something might come in tomorrow night for tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. for the next morning even, yeah. and like yeah. whatever. Yeah, I mean, do you? Because like you say, you don't like rushing around, so. I'm right. assuming you don't like worrying about stuff as well, but like, yes. how do you deal with that? Being a being a self-employed musician, like, I don't know. Which, do you have stuff that's booked in far in advance, or is it? Yeah, uh, well, ha- I have. Yeah, I've, uh, my diary is. Uh, I'm going to go and get my diary. <laughs> I'll tell you this. Uh, this is what the state of play is this afternoon. This week, Thursday's ten thirty to one thirty. Friday's one till four in Hyde Park. Saturday is 10 till 1 in Hyde Park. Then I'm going to have to come home again because the concert's at 7.15. Then Sunday I'm driving to Stables at Wavendon to do a... I do this fantastic band where we play Joni Mitchell tunes, only Joni Mitchell tunes. Great. Yeah, it's fantastic. I get to play all the Jacko bass Amazing. lines. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's lovely. That's worth no money at all. But <laughs> Well, it, it'll be worth a few quid, but um, that's that. Right, week after, I've got a 606 gig with Hamish on a Wednesday and I'm driving to Chichester to, for very little money, again with Hamish, next Saturday. So that's two gigs. Right. But that's not enough money. <laughs> so that's all right. Is that likely to change between... Uh, them well, it would be nice, but it would be nice. I mean, it's kind of... Because the show's finished in start of June, um, this is kind of... I'm wondering whether to phone a few people and say, can I come in and dep? Because I used to dep in Mamma Mia and right. I've got mates who will probably say, come in and dep. But if I can avoid it, I will. Is it kind of like you, you've been on a show and then like it's finished? Yeah. So people people have known you've been busy for two and a half years yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of almost like there's a period after you finish working where yeah. people start to realise that you're about more? Is that, is that, Possibly. Is that Although, the, my, like that? well, I've always made it sure that the things. People don't book, don't not book me because they I'm in a show because they know I can always get out of it. So oh, okay, you see right. what I mean. So yeah. so it's, it doesn't have an so effect. It doesn't affect no. it too much. Um, I mean, uh, yeah. So there's that. And then there's a the week after I'm doing a, uh, a guitar players album with Ian Thomas. Then I'm doing the BBC Concert Orchestra. That's two days with uh, doing the orchestral Queen. All the all the Queen songs, but with an orchestra. I've done it for quite a few years. I was there when the the original thing was arranged. We've right. been to America with it and all that. Wow. That's that's a, that's a radio show at the Coliseum. That'll be good. Uh, and then another album, another session the morning after that. What we got there? I mean, there's a nice little gig just up the road here. Really nice. That's with Adam. Adam's band. Mm. Not worth very much money. Then Michael Ball. And Alfie Bow for two days at ITV. Uh, Hamish, oh no, not Hamish there. And then I've got nothing. Uh, John Paraccioli, another little gig, another little gig. These are all just nothing gigs at all. So then I'm into 19th of, uh, 18th, 19th of October, which is a char- big charity do for Suggs out of Madness, which that's kind of the week's money. That'll be all right. The week after that, three nights at Ronnie's with the Ronnie Scott's big band. That'll be on double bass. Not a lot, not very, not enough money. Um, November, one gig. Week after, one gig. Not very much. Uh, two gigs the week after that. We're going to Dundee with Hamish. We're going to Wimborne in Dorset two days later. Uh, and then we're into the end of November where I know I'm going to have a clash, which is really going to bug me. Because I do the Royal Variety Show, that'll be three days. Right. And that's an earner because it's a TV show and what yeah. have you. But I've got a feeling Hamish is going to get Ronnie Scott's in that, that week as well. So that'll be a clash. Right. 
but none of these. I mean, the T. Oh, there's a uh, sports personnel of the year I do as well, right. which is three days. Will be two, three days in Liverpool. That's good money. So you see what I mean? It's sort yeah. of like oh, Christ knows. I, one thing I'm sure of is I'm not going to freak out about it. So you're not worried about it at all, like no. This is normally what it looks like. Is it in terms of like far in the future? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, all right. So the session I did on Saturday morning last week came in weeks' notice. Right. Um. So it's all it's all pretty close. Yeah. To get like if yeah. it gets sorted. Yeah. So with, with without having like the runs on shows in town or whatever, has is it been like that for all the other gigs for you know the majority of your my career, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, um, I did. Well, that's two and a half years ago. The business has maybe changed, and perhaps younger players have started doing my sessions. I don't know. <laughs> I've no idea what's happened. I'm really taking any notice because yeah. I just get on with it, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. But I've, so you've I've, never worried about it. It's, it's always sorted itself out, like you're saying. I, well, I'm not going to say I, I'm not. I'm, I've tried, a, attempted not to worry about it. Yeah. I mean, there have been times where um, I haven't worked, you know, but I can't do anything else, so yeah. I just have to get on with it. Also, I'm I'm quite good at saving money. Right. Um, when my I always say to young younger people who do shows who get a show, mm. um, and they're all. It's completely knocked out, obviously, because they're going, whoopee, I can get a mortgage. And I, and I say, I always say to them, budget yourself for six of the eight shows. Live on six of the eight shows. And then take a night off and have a life. Right. Otherwise, you get show fever. You'll, you, you won't do anything else. You'll start turning into other things down. Or I, I mean, I've always used you looked upon shows as kind of something to keep me going while I do wait for the sessions to come in. You know, so basically and been, just filling all the gaps, yeah, and all the other stuff. Yeah, and it's a really good thing like that. But I mean, I if you can live on six shows out of eight, then if you get a nasty tax bill in, you just do the extra two shows, and, right. and you know what I mean. You've yeah. Got, that's the way I. That's the way I've always looked at it, and also mm -hmm. I'm not a big credit card debt runner up. I, I've sure. never been like that. Always paid it on you time. Just you be know. smart with the yeah, money. Yeah, man. And, because yeah. you never know. I mean, I've only got two hands. Anything could happen, couldn't it? You know. Mm. Um, and anything could happen to anything else around you. So, I, I'm I'm cautious in that respect. You know. Yeah. I've seen people get into financial difficulties. You know. Mm. So, uh, so in talking about finances, if you've got like the gigs that you've got in at the moment, they're like kind of, I, I want to say like the fun gigs, like yeah, they seem to be the ones are, that yeah. you enjoy most. Yeah, cause, absolutely, like, they are all, yeah. But financially yeah. they're not as lucrative as all no. the other stuff. So what happens if you get something in, I don't know if that does happen, whether it clashes a lot, um, but if you've got sessions happen during the day, so maybe not that, but if you've got something, you know what I mean, if you've got something else in, yeah. when you've already got the stuff which is yeah. like 50 quid in... Yeah. Wherever, what do you do? Do you normally okay? So, let, let, for example, um, I generally always do Hamish Stewart's gig when I can. Um, I turn sometimes turn quite good work down, and why is that? Because I love playing that music, mm. and I, if I can afford to, I will. But he's also pretty cool about me putting a dep in, so he you understands, know. yeah, he totally yeah. understands. And in fact, I the Joni Mitchell gig I'm uh, not doing s Saturday because I'm at Hyde Park doing the three days at the Proms yeah. in the Park yeah. so Phil Mulford's doing that for me he's really happy I'm, I've written all the parts out so that it's uh, easy for him he doesn't he, all he has to do is play through them and read them mm. uh, that's not always the case yeah. um, so I, in fact that's why I had to choose that over the music gig because the too much money and the three days yeah. with the concert orchestra the TV show and they paid me well so I had to get out of that and the girl who sings it Gina she understood that because I'm actually dropping her in it and putting a new dep in 
Yeah. Even though it would be fine, you know. Um, I know a lot of people do worry about that when they have to get debts. Well, for quite you know specific what? things. Yes, the, but the uh, my rule of thumb there is is if, you, if you've taken the gig in in good faith, then you have to do it. If the person is is sometimes they I mean people are reasonable, you know. I mean, Jean is. She said, "I understand, understand. Mm. Don't worry about it. We'll sort it out." And which we did. So that's fine. But. If that if the person who's originally booked me says you can't you can't let me down like that I can't get anybody else and that sometimes happens you know right you have to blow the money out you have to blow the get money gig out because if you get a reputation for doing that people won't book you mm. because it's not the right way of doing it and, and let's face it it's one gig isn't it yeah but actually the damage you can do to your reputation is is immeasurable you know? did you ever do that when you were first starting out and you were a bit younger did you ever think um, did you ever turn something down because of that, thinking like, oh, I really wish I could do that because that's like a new contact, that's a new thing and I'd love to do it, but I've already got this in so I've got to stay with it. No, I've, I've, I'll always, I'll, I'll phone the person who I'm, who's booked me for the original gig mm. and I'll say, look, this is coming and I really want to do it. Yeah. Um, ha- can I put a dep in? Generally, people are all right because I mean I I wouldn't dep a session out. You just you would no way you would if you had a session, yeah. And you had like unless if it was like a three month tour, you got with a pop act or whatever or somebody amazing, yeah. And I went to Isabel Griffiths, who I've worked for thirty years. I'd feel really, really would I would be really scared about phoning right. her up. Do you know what I mean? Because she booked you specifically because she yes. knows your skills. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And also that's that I have worked for her for thirty years and, and we have a fantastic relationship and I've done incredible work for her. Mm. And she has been you know, and I so I wouldn't do that to her. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh and and oh I have turned many things down. I, I guess now you, you talk about it. Yeah, I've turned things down out because there's some things you just wouldn't put a dep in for, you know, mm. even though they might not even be very good, you know, you yeah, know they're, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, even though they're sessions, but they're, they're like... So oh even God, though the, gig, the other gig you've offered, it might, you might put it as a better gig in your mind. Yeah. You don't feel like... It could be even better money-wise and music-wise. Yeah. But if the, the gig that you've already taken in means that it, it goes against my principle of... of I would be letting somebody down. Mm. I, I wouldn't do that. Sure. You know, and therefore I don't have a reputation for being flaky and some people do. Right. Some people don't get booked. They go, oh no, he let me down, you know. Yeah, yeah. And reputation's a massive thing. Well, the thing is about music, the music business, everybody fucking knows it the next morning. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's ne- Everyone is waiting. Or, you know, all the people of your own instrument going, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? <laughs> you know, it's like the bush... Telegraph is terrifying. Right. You know, I mean, everyone knows everybody because it's not, it's not that big yeah. a business really. What's left of it, you know, that's the thing. Mm. So, do you, you feel like knowing, like knowing people, is like one of the like who you know? Yeah, is much more important than like what you know, what you can do. Uh, well, no, because there are no passengers in my studio world. Right. No, none. Okay. There aren't, if, if, and that includes every instrument, because basically, if you, if you are slowing the session down, whether you're the third trumpet player or the singers are loud because they're the turn, right? Yeah or whoever's in charge, but us lot on the ground, do not fuck up, do not slow things down, do not answer, ask stupid questions, do not put your own ego first, mm. do not try your favourite lick, do not show off, just get on with it and let's get out of here with our reputation right. intact. Yeah, yeah. Because it's fucking hard, it's stressful, it's hard, and basically... You're in, you're in the firing line. Yeah. The red light goes on, and that's it. And it doesn't matter. What, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes, you know. Sometimes I can it, on certain things. I've said, no, we we'll need to do another one of those. And um, as long as it's not pissing off the lead trumpet player who's having to play something very high, 
you know, there's kind of, yeah. you know, if there's the more you, the more musicians there are in a studio, the more you have to get your shit together and not co- create waves. Right, so right. that mean that means um, making decisions about what you might, how you're going to play. Shall, shall you try something new with the risk of blowing it, or shall you just play what's written? Yeah. See what I mean? There's yeah, like yeah, yeah. trade off all the time like that, and you get very good at at, uh, at working out what you can do and what you can't do. But what you were saying is like is like if you're if you come in with you know and you're blowing it and and somebody's they, they look over you going you know you ain't gonna be invited back you and it's, so it's that cutthroat. Well, it is that cutthroat yeah, because yeah, yeah. Uh, you know time time is money. In, in the studio mm. and they want to get it done you know so what's like so if you're um, if I ask for two examples so let, let's do one so if you go into Abbey Road yeah and it's just like you and like you say like you and Ralph like yeah. drums and bass yeah what's like what's the typical kind of how does the process work from when you walk into Abbey Road to do the session Okay, uh, well first of all you've got to get to stop Ralph talking <laughs> <laughs> no uh, well, it'll be a laugh because it's me and Ralphie and whoever books us. Well, I mean, first of all, I, look, well, let's be serious. If, if there's two things, if it's somebody we've worked for before, mm. we'll have a laugh. Right. We're, we're, it'll be banter and it'll be relaxed and it'll be fun, and until for for however long, and then we'll have either the music, we'll have the music, and we'll listen to a demo, and we'll make. Uh, pencil marks and then we'll go and play it and but there won't be it won't be it won't be there won't be nerves there won't be if i'm talking about just me and ralph because we're such great mates right in fact we did the new michael ball alfie bow album me ralph and pete murray in abbey road Mm. Uh, abbey road studio too steve seaborg was upstairs i've known him since i was 18 right so it's fine We've done yeah. millions of things together, so that's good fun. So when you're saying like time is money, does all, all the banter and all of the the good laugh and everything does that happen like before the red light goes on, before the money starts? Like, uh, oh, I see what you mean. No, 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 no. It goes, early, well, well, first of all, like, you you first okay. So here's the calculation: <laughs> three hour session. How many tears we got? We on the Michael Ball one. There was banter, but actually we did six tunes in for in. Did we do more? I was two sessions, eight eight songs for an album. We had to do all of it. And so that's eight songs over six hours. Uh, worth. Yeah, is, is that quite a lot? For... Uh, I've done more. Yeah. I've done more than that, and also uh, done less within that. And I've yeah. also done. I, I have more trouble doing less, to be honest, because right. uh, you, you're on it, aren't you? And is that down to you, or is that down to the producer, like somebody being like, "Let's do it again, let's do it like this"? Or yeah, there could be that. It could be somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, right. but thinks that. You know, it could be if it's a pop thing, and it's an artist, and there's a guitar player who doesn't read. Then I have to suspend my normal kind of way of being efficient mm. because I'm just going to get up over everybody's nose. I'm like, I'm going, come on, that was all right. That's <laughs> fucking, what, what do you want to do it again for? You know, I've yeah, yeah, seen yeah. people do that as well. You know, and get annoyed because you've had to play it six times, right. but. You got that's part of it as well. You got to judge that. That's all part of it. So if you're saying me and Ralph, if we walk in and somebody, uh, somebody wants to do it again and again, we can we'll say, well, that was pretty good, you know. And sometimes, especially now, when you've got multiple takes, mm. me and Ralph, if we are in a situation where people respect what we've done before, we can say. You know what? The you one before was bit, better. Bit it was much better. Check the check out that bit, and and also me and Ralph completely police the bass and drums at, at times. If we people are used to it, and some people who aren't used to it sort of go look back and go, "Fuck off! These guys are amazing." Because I'm going, Ralph, be good if we just push into that there. You know, yeah. what, what should we play there? Well, let's let's try it, and and that'll be a a chat we'll have. You know. Mm. Um, between yourselves rather than waiting for someone to tell you yes because sometimes people don't know there'll be a a little guy with a piano piano, 
Right. And and he, he doesn't know what he wants. So yeah. that's why you book me and Ralph. Yeah. You know. And we come in and we'll um we'll say and they'll go, That was amazing and we go, No, no, we'll do one more, we'll do one more, you know. Yeah. And you know what, here, let's play that there, maybe just just play one and three on a bass drum, Ralph, and I'll I'll play the kicks or whatever. You know what I mean? So you two are really like. Do you have conversations like this all the time when you're all doing the time? It? Yeah. Spe- like- more, actually, probably with Ralph more than anything. In fact, I usually write the parts, bass parts out, and he photocopies them and uses them as his drum parts. Right, right, right. So, uh, uh, but but there's no ego involved. Like, no, if, no, if he's no. like Steve, do it like this. You're like cool. Let's yeah, try it. totally. Then, yeah, absolutely and utterly. That's how we work, mm. and it's all in the in it's it's because we're serving the music and in we're trying to be efficient for the person who's booked us. When it gets sticky, is when you've got people who've written something that is clearly bollocks. Right. So, me and Ralph, we're playing, and he'll go, "What are you playing?" And I'm going, "What's what's there?" And he's going, "Really." And, and we'll go, you know, then we might say to the guy, do you want that? You, you really want us to play like that? He said, well, no, 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 you take... And generally, they all, if they give it up to us and say, no, you do what you like, and say, I'll go real. So then, right, we, okay. then we start again, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's what takes the time. So otherwise, there's so, very few people who write... You can, If you write nothing or just the basics, we'll take care of it for you because we'll bring that record collection over there yeah. we'll bring all of those grooves I'll say to Ralph you know that remember that Gadsden thing you play oh yeah let's try that oh that's a good idea yeah, yeah. and all of a sudden we're bringing our musical experience to your track mm. and we're talking about drummers that you don't even never, probably never heard of but you're going to love when he plays like James Gadsden on your yeah, tune yeah. because your tune that you've written is a little bit like that tune that we know so well. See what I mean? Yeah. So these days, the sessions are much more efficient when somebody writes something like pretty sparse and then you have a 30 seconds back and forth and then you, you can yeah. go straight in and record something. Yeah, you. it can be. But uh, I mean, it's, it's down to personalities really though, isn't it? Because I mean, I mean, the thing is, you, you, we you have to look after us as well. Don't treat us like assholes and and sort of talk bollocks because we're we're bullshit monitors. Are, are set to stun, you know, yeah. set to kill, right? <laughs> so it's like you know we do know we do have been doing this, but you know if you tell Ralph to go dubba dubba cha in the wrong place, he's going to go. That just sounds rubbish, you know. <laughs> you won't say that, but you know. I mean, so I, I don't know. It's a bit difficult to sort of be general, yeah. generalize about things. So when you first started doing it, though, how how was it different when you first started doing it? Were, were you more like shut up and oh yeah, told? oh definitely yeah. yeah 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 yeah. I mean, I probably lost work from being mouthy, and I don't mind that either. Really. really? Well, the thing is, it's like there are people. I, I've walked into studios and I and I've very quickly thought I'm not going to get on with you I'm just not going to get on with it no matter how hard I try and I'm going to try and make your music sound great I, that's my job but for whatever reason you've got you are intimidated because I can read music or I've written your, a part out from your demo mm. and I will play it brilliantly the first time from your demo and I'll say do you want me to play that exactly well, I'm that, I quite like this part of your your demo and I really like that bass line it'll be some you know sometimes people write demo play bass themselves and it'll be so lovely and naive that I'll go oh, that's so fantastic you know but if they get freaked out at the fact that I've got a piece of music in front of me which does happen that and they think oh my god a proper musician he's going to find me out and it's not like that at all but that's happened to me right. and there's nothing I can do nothing <laughs> I can do to 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 stop them from from being intimidated by me, and I know that that's I'm going to have a problem, you know, and that has happened. That right. has happened, and I just have to do my best and go home, you know. Yeah. Do you find that happening more and more these days? Is there like a trend in terms of people coming in and who, the guys who are like booking the session or running it? Well, not, first of all, first so of all, usually these days on those sort of sessions, I'm booked by a producer. Um, who I've worked with before, right. who trusts me. So he knows that if I'm a little bit, not sharp, but if I'm up front 
it, I don't mean it out of being arsy. I mean it because I want to serve the music. Sure. And yeah. and a lot of people are really happy that I've got some some idea. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because otherwise you're just sitting there with a sheet of chords, and and that's that's no good at all. I mean, if I I bring a base concept to the the track, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so, so so it works with like the artist will book the producer and then the producer yeah, books you. Yeah. Right. So, so the first already, time you meet them is at the studio. Yes, yeah. uh, that happens all the time. Right. But my reputation goes before me. The producers already big me up or said I've got Steve Pierce. The great thing about it these days is that people go on Google, Google my name and you and they go fucking hell, you know. I mean, I have got a fairly impressive CV. Yeah. So it uh, people are, you know, they'll probably go did you work with uh, Van Morrison? I go, yeah, yeah. And they're kind of like, want to hear the stories, yeah. which I'm quite happy to talk to them about. So that's almost like goes before you. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So when did you first get to, did it just kind of happen naturally? Like when, when you first got to the stage where you're in a studio and you initially were like, kind of put up your hand or you were just like, you know, yeah. hold on a second. Like, I, I think it should be like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, was there a moment when you were kind of a bit like, should I say this or like, whatever? Um, I think, I think, especially with bass, I've got quite a concept of how to play bass and how it should sound. And if I play, if you give me your chart and I'll play it, the notes will be the, right, but how long the notes are will be my choice so yeah. if you write like a dotted crotchet and a quaver tied to a minim I'll I'll get I'll play my concept of those three notes which there might be 50 I could probably show you 10 where you would notice the difference mm. but they don't write. They don't know that. All they know is it sounds fantastic or it doesn't. Right. And that might be, you know, if I stop the note a bit, the length of note in between the dotted crotchet and the quaver or I play it a little bit nearer the bridge or, you know, or I'll, I'll do... There's never... Nobody ever writes bloody dynamics on the bass <laughs> part. So I go, where's the chorus? All right, I go, is this the intro? Because I want to make a difference in the sections it's playing yeah. the song you know what I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's my concept that I bring to the to the thing I might alter it slightly but I'm, because I've been doing it for so long um, I can pr pretty much immediately work out what it is but when I was younger you can still go in and just play the notes and it'll be alright it's just because mm. most people don't know yeah, in the middle in the middle of it's my uh, bass is just bass, isn't it? You know, I mean, the, the, the great thing, the, the classic thing is you go into the studio and they go, take hours getting a drum sound. They go, can we have a bit of bass? And they'll go, yeah. And I'll say, sounds like a bass guitar, doesn't it? They go, yeah, you know, because I'm so used to being overlooked because it's yeah, just yeah. like, no one knows what, you know, I know that if it's a Fender Rhodes and I play a Fender Precision, it will sound fantastic because those two instruments grew up together in historically, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll, I will play, I might choose a precision over this. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that, and no one will know why. I don't want any thanks <laughs> for it. You know, forget yeah, it. They'll yeah. go, God, it sounds great. Cool, oh, cheers. Yeah, yeah. So well, you kind of feel like you've got a bit of free reign as a bass player. Totally, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the great thing is, I talked I talk to Trevor Barry about this, because this is what we talk about, is... Uh, we we do our own thing really, right? And and it'll be fine as long as people trust it. It'll be fine. My my worst thing is is in the studio, is engineers who don't get the concept of what a bass guitar and a bass drum is supposed to sound like. Right. So I go. So I I do sometimes go in the box when we've done a tape and walk in. I go, can you just put the bass the weight of the bass drum. Can you can you take the click off the bass drum just just a bit and sit it uh, sit it underneath the bass guitar sound? Mm. Because what happens is there's two things going at the front of the note, and you don't want that. Yeah. But even if they're 
completely and utterly in time, which generally they are, I might add. <laughs> but some, even if they aren't, you're getting two lots of click, and you don't want that. So I, I prefer my bass sound to be the the round thing like that, and then you sit the lovely <coughs> of a bass drum which hits you in the chest with a little click on the top, and then there's this beautiful sort of pear shaped sonic thing every right. every time we play together. Yeah. And it's just like nudges the song along, you know. And sometimes they, because engineers are just recording, they're not mixing. Mm. But to me, if you start off with the bass and drums sounding beautiful and together, then whatever you record on top of that, it's all lovely. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you feel like that helps your performance as well. To, well, you not only that, it helps people who you're working for because they all of a sudden they start. They move nodding their head to it because because it's like the finest steely dang groove or whatever you yeah. know I mean, that's what we're after on a lot of things you know um, sometimes not but when you, we work with different engineers who don't have some engineers don't have that concept and because I do right. and Ralph for that matter because he's got his own studio yeah um, yeah he's um, we we rock viola people. <laughs> quite often you know about that can you turn their overheads down or whatever because you you're listening to his drums is not sounding right and he knows how to record his drums you know? yeah, yeah absolutely. just take the overheads down and just, or i just get but just nudge the bass up a bit mm. you know i i go in and, and generally the reason they say it sounds like a bass guitar because i work with a lot of the same engineers they don't touch my bass they don't eq it yeah they, they don't even you know i mean they don't even put any compression on it, and I don't because I play really evenly because I've worked that out. My dynamics are within my fingers, so you know, and it gives me that big dynamic range. If you take put a compressor in it, sort of squashes it a bit, mm. you know. Yeah, but that's just from getting it wrong a few times, I suppose. Right. You know, I mean, I was very frightened as a young player in the studios for quite a few years, yeah, and I still get frightened, still do, especially, really? yes, I mean. Conductors, you know, I mean, where the beat is, that's not my background at all. Now, I have to have serious bottle because where is it? All the strings, all the strings go Wah, whatever they like behind the lead fiddle. Mm. I go bong like that and play the time. And so I have to get where his groove is. And I must do all right because I get asked for by certain people because they know I'm going to take care of it for them yeah. because they've got a whole orchestra to try and carve their way through and they know that I'm right on it I'm ne I never look I'm not, I'm not like everybody else all the, that look they all say what you even look up at, you look up at him and <laughs> I go yeah I do actually and you know if I'm playing with Mike Smith which I'll probably be this week he's an absolute master at following a conductor right. and we when we when we nail it a tempo change or you know we all nail it and we look at each other and go yeah man uh, because it's a thing that we've had to come going through and it's bottle yeah. it's absolute <laughs> bottle and if we arrive at the beat together and slot the whole orchestra in and they and the other thing is is that they see me and mike they then go oh right we better we better they're right. Right. You see what I mean? You so it's a reputation. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And, it, and that's a nice thing as you get older to acquire it, but it comes out of being very scared, right. really scared from not, not having an orchestral experience, you know, mm. to pl and playing the downbeat. God, dear. Yeah, so just being really on it. Yeah. Just, yeah. 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 So, so going back to the being in the studio with just two of you yeah so once you sort everything out and whatever and like you know you you have a dialogue as you're going yeah. if you're if you're doing like a track how, how many takes do you normally do of it it does it vary depending on other people's opinions or well you, uh, you know mean? what if, let's go let's use me and ralph as an example right just me and ralph we want to not get bored right because mm -hmm. The first take will be brilliant, and it'll be rocking, and we'll be together, and we all because we always are. The third, fourth take, it, we're gonna not get bored, but it's gonna be hard to emulate the energy of the first take. Right. So what we like to do, 
we'll do as many takes as you like, but it would be nice to have some concept on the demo. We'll listen and we'll go, oh, that'd be good there. And we'll play that there. Da, 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 da. It, it, doesn't take, it doesn't usually take long. Not yeah. really. And because if it's difficult music, it's generally written out, which we'll just read. Yeah. All we're interested in is getting the groove, how we like it. Right. You know, and uh, well, I did Tommy Blaze's album with Ralph last week, week before, I can't remember. We did four tracks and it was killing. We did a version of Stevie Wonder's As um, off of Songs in the Key of Life. Yeah. And uh, I looked across it, uh, it was so wicked. I hadn't played with Ralph for a while, and certainly not that sort of music. We generally play something a bit lighter than that, <laughs> yeah. and certainly not as groovy. And it was just so great, it was so great. And we had, I think, we had two takes, and um, it was just a question of tempo. Um, and but the first one was us getting it together, which was the slower groovier tempo and this and the second one was fantastic and all in the right place but it was a little bit faster and we sat around we it was four of us uh robbie mackintosh guitar dave arch me and ralph and hayden bendel was, was the producer and the engineer fantastic um and we were both sitting there we sitting there, play it oh so good that tempo so good yeah but we blew the end didn't we we blew it. We blew the end. And the second one, so good. The ending's great because we went into this sort of vamp at the end. And we're going. Well, um, what? And Hayden just said to me and Ralph, he said, "Well, what do you think? What, what do you fancy?" I said, "Well, look, if the first one, slow one, didn't exist, the second one, I'd go. That's a great pop. Put, put that's like proper pop play. Great, yeah, recorded vibe groove." I said, I know what you mean about the slowness, but we haven't got it, you know. And it wasn't a case of going back and doing it again. It was because we had it already and we had other tunes to do as well. Yeah. So there was there's the time thing going on. And so they went with the, the uh, as far as I know, they went with the, the perfect one, you know. Right. Uh, and it was great. It was, there's no doubt about it. It was absolutely, bur both of them were burning. Yeah. yeah. So you know when you go in now, if you're doing something like that with somebody you know, yeah, you know that you can nail it first, second. Like they'll both be usable, like perfectly good. We'll tell them. Some people say, "Oh, that's great. That would be that'd be great." We go, "No, we'll do another one. Definitely right. do another." One. And the other thing of this, and this is something that I I or generally insist on, is if Ralph wants to do his drums again, and I'm perfect, I'll play it again. Because right. I can always hear, I can all. I, it, it never feels right if Ralph puts his. It, there's a click of me, and he goes and does his drums again. It won't be. It won't be groovy because he'll be playing. He'll be playing. On top of me, rather than us playing together. Right. The energy in the room it sounds a bit wanky. Sorry. It's sort of no, like it spiritual, sense, <laughs> spiritual mumbo jumbo, whatever. But I believe that. There's a, there's when we and him play together, or me and Yanto or whatever. If you play, if you create the bass and drums together, you at all times you are talking to each other sonically. Mm. So, and if you know, I think even if I go, if I do my bass again on top of Ralph's drums, it it won't be as good as if we play it together. Right. The drop it, I can drop things in, and we often drop fills in or do an edit or uh he'll do the verse again because there'll be an idea for it yeah you know but i'll go and play with him you know or if i blow you know going into the chorus or a wrong now i'll drop something in and that'll be fine yeah but if you're doing like a whole take this that's where the magic is for right me, you know okay so how does it work on so for a second example if you're doing like a bigger thing like a big band recording yes or something yeah how do, how is that how does that differ from well you the thing is the more musicians there are the more arranged it will be right so generally you're you're sight reading and you're getting it done and you just got to get it right and you do like one two takes still yeah maybe i mean there might be god I did something for britain's got talent big band and the arrangements were unnecessarily hard for the brass shall right. we say and we did it again 
and, he, and then they changed it and then he did that and I could see Ralph having the answer getting in the arse <laughs> sake because it was like I don't know New York New York or something and someone had written something to tear a whole new arse off for it it was like pointless you know yeah, yeah. and you just got to keep batting away and getting it right you know so uh, so in those situations it's not like you can drop the whole brass in for just one thing or sometimes sometimes, sometimes they do I mean some and sometimes funny enough me and Ralph will go in and say we don't have to play that again, do we? And if it's the right engineer and the right producer, they'll go, no, you'll be fine, you know, and we yeah. go, thank fuck for that. You <laughs> so know what I mean? So they just drop the brass on top yeah, of what you've already exactly. Done. And sometimes there's not separation in the studio where you can play together anyway. Yeah, it's all just in one yeah. room. Yeah. yeah. So it's sometimes we do rhythm section. Fortunately, it's usually rhythm section first and then right. they put the strings on, then yeah. the brass on. I mean, actually on that session, funnily enough, we did one all together which took ages and then they did it all in bits and it's like oh god <laughs> you know it's, it's a nightmare really but I mean you have to keep that level of nervous energy up yeah and that comes back to what we were saying earlier on about uh, there are no passengers there can't be anyone get I mean there are, have been sessions where people get the arse especially lead trumpet players going I'm not going to play that again mm. that was fine that was you know and it will get sort of a bit sticky right but um that's why you can't be wrong. Yeah. And that's, you know. So being in a studio, is there, are there certain skills that you would rank above others or is it you just use more certain skills more in different situations depending on the session you're doing? I like, suppose different, yeah, different skills. Like you've got to be really on it with the reading if you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. But and yet they're not going to stop for you. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, here's the extreme. You're in a, uh, on a film and you're sitting in Abbey Road Studio One with 90 people, all of whom are fabulous sight readers, because that's what they do. Fiddle players just read fly shit. Yeah. And you've got, uh, well, I'll give you an example. I did Doctor Strange, that movie, right? And there is a, uh, a minim triplet written over a bar, and I couldn't fucking phrase it with it fiddles and they just sat there and went wee, 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 because they're trained to do that I couldn't, I couldn't fucking hear it I try, and it was kept coming all the way through and, but the thing was I got it and I got it right and then they went I think we'll have to do another one because we're going to change that can we change it because what you I mean some film sessions are four hours long and you play one piece of music right. for four hours and you sit there and then they'll watch it to picture and they'll come back and go okay right um French horns, just mark that down to mezzo piano there, please. And you have got to play exactly the same thing. And this, check this out, you might have to count 75 bars rest before you go bong like that. And, that, and you have to nail it when you come in. Every as well. time, because they're not going to stop for you. You can't get it wrong. So they're not going to stop at a bass guitar, are they? Yeah. With 90 people, for guys sake. There's a, there, look, you know, you'll get through it, a perfect one, and they'll go, sorry, there was a, there was a noise in the room. Because, I mean, in. Abbey Road Studio One, it's an enormous thing. And if, if you go like that, or even like that, that'll come out, you know, it'll ring around the thing. Right. Everyone has to be completely silent. Uh, it's So it's, it's I think it's pretty... Right. So if you're doing a film session with like a massive orchestra like that, is there a lot of waiting around, waiting to oh, hear back from... Unbelievable, yeah. yeah. And you've got to keep that nervous energy going every all the time. That's I find that really draining. Quite hard yeah, for a I long do, session. I, yeah, I do. I mean, I don't do very that. In fact, Doctor Strange was the last thing I did where I was booked in the orchestra, because generally, um, um, I do the end titles or they'll do a rhythm section session. Mm. But yeah, they're quite tiring. They're they're really tiring. You can be there for days doing that sort yeah. of thing. You know. So yeah. there's all sorts of things. Yeah. yeah that's it's fascinating, all, everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes it's really good. I mean, sometimes at uh, Abbey Road, uh, they, you know, you're in a little booth. So it's me and Adam just pissing about yeah. in between. <laughs> and there's, there's Ian Thomas in the room over there. And, you know, it's, so it's, it's kind of light-hearted, but it's very serious at the same time, you know. Yeah, like it doesn't matter if you're having a good time as long as you're nailing yeah, your yeah. hair still. No, no, no. I mean, obviously there's, you can, you can, piss about too much but mm. that doesn't really happen right really yeah you know, it's, it's take, we're taking care of business first you know absolutely that's for sure 
that's really interesting that thing you've got hanging on the left in there it's just like oh that's my Van, Van Morrison cheat sheet yeah <laughs> well, I mean, it's like how little there is written down for each well, thing yeah, I don't know, I'll tell you that, uh, that um, when I got the Van Morrison gig I did I got booked to mine on Wogan he used right. to have a a chap show in the 80s and I was in the house band many many times but I got I got booked to mine with Van Morrison and I went along and he I don't know why but he just booked me for his for an album and I, I ended up going down to Bath for a residential studio for a week and that was my start on my working with him right and um, then I got he wanted me to to play with his band, you know, so I said, oh great, so he didn't turn up to any of the rehearsals, and the MD said, we could play any number of 50 tunes, I went, fuck it now, I wasn't going to learn this, <laughs> so I took that piece of, this score paper, mm. and just decided to give each tune a line, and then I'll have some chance, and the worst thing is, the band is invariably in the same key, and a lot of them are very similar, Right, but I used to tape that to the monitor oh, on okay. stage, and um, uh, yeah, that's how I, that's, that's really my cute. cheat sheet. Yeah, <laughs> man. So what can we talk about? All the live stuff you've done now. Yeah, well? yeah, yeah. Like, what was it like? Um, what, I mean, what was your first big like live gig that you would consider like touring wise going off? Because you've done a few things with yeah a few different artists. Yeah, I have yeah. Um, I didn't really do very much live stuff until I started working with Everything But The Girl. Mm. I did their, an album with them and then a tour. So that's how you got to know them, you were booked to do their album first? I was or? booked, <coughs> funny enough I told this story the other day because um, I got booked by, it was an amazing Saturday morning because I got a call on the Friday night beforehand and they said, Robin Miller was, was a producer who produced Sade's album and God knows who else. <clears throat> Can you come down tomorrow morning for a session? Uh, we had a bass player today and I didn't like him at all. He's, he, he, this is really funny. Because he, yeah, he, uh, all he did was talk about the Des O'Connor TV show and repeat checks and TVs and all that. And he blew himself out. So I went, anyway, I went down there, met Ben and Tracy, did the track. And Robin said, that was great. That's really good. You're coming back and finish the album off. And, and by the way, this is for a film. Can you invoice Isabel Griffiths, who I've worked for for 30 years now? Right. That was So all on that Saturday morning, I, I ended up doing albums with Robin Miller, working with Ben and Tracy to, almost to this day, countless al albums and TVs and little... Uh, live things and stuff and I've worked for Isabel Griffiths and all because the bass player the, the afternoon before did exactly what I said we were talking about which is he blew himself out from talking about light and TV well, light no, entertainment nothing to do with his playing at all. Was just I don't think they liked his playing either oh, right, okay. but, um, they didn't like his playing I don't think so, so but anyway, that didn't help his case no they no. didn't <laughs> and, and uh, it was just didn't fit in you know right. it's like you don't talk about the two Ronnies or whatever yeah, or yeah. the pop session it's pretty obvious isn't it really but I mean he didn't give it but, but he was busy and went on to still is you know so yeah, yeah. that's fine but right. um, sorry what we did what we well, talking so, about oh, I mean, what, live things okay yeah. so I went on to, I went on tour with uh, everything but the girl what was the like main difference you found playing live compared to in, in the studio where you were uh, used to it, I guess Well, that's a whole other thing, isn't it? Touring is... I haven't really ever... I've done a... I've done... I have toured, actually, but that, that's a whole other thing, keeping your shit together on the roads and, right. you know, living in hotels and stuff. That's... It's great, but you have to take care of yourself. Quite and I'm, I'm not really... I haven't been very successful at looking after myself. <laughs> I've been away. It's been uh, a lot of fun, you know. But, uh, no, I, I, I mean, getting to play on a big stage is fantastic mm. your bass sounds completely different right because you are in you know on a huge stage i mean the, the this is before the, that 
uh, days of in ears. And in fact, um, when I, I most of my touring I've done with Tom Jones. That's been all over the world. Yeah, I was going to ask you about um, that. As well. And when he started, he used to have on the side of the stage side fills. I don't know if you know what they are. They're just like massive speakers about the size of my CD case right. there, which you, he'd have his vocals in. Really? And if you could get your bass in the side, the, the um, sound on stage was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Because it's like bass all around them. Really <laughs> fantastic feeling, you know. Uh, but you have to play quite differently, really. There's a touch thing going on. You, you, you don't get the definition you do in headphones. So that's a, a way of, you know. But I mean, I've always played live in on different things, concerts and so stuff. you didn't know. have to learn that when you first went out, you already kind of were aware of... Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I started playing live, so you, you kind of learned yeah. about I mean, boomy bass rooms and yeah, stuff, you know. Yeah, playing in a pub compared to playing on, like, a massive stage. Yeah. Two completely different... Yeah, they are, but I'm, at the same time, you could go to um, a tiny pub and the bass would sound like shit because there's, like, stone walls everywhere, mm. or, you know, and then, you know, and all the trumpet players love... Brass players like playing in live things, and then I like playing in a marquee, right? Or where it's really dead because you can you can dial bottom end in, um, like no, there's no tomorrow, yeah. and you can get a real. There's no boominess for me as a bass player. I love playing in dead places, you know. Right. So, but, it, uh, compared to like all the stages that you did as you went around, did did you kind of turn up to a stage and have to? assess the acoustics and change or were they all pretty no similar? you're in the hands of the uh, monitor engineer really aren't you right so you don't have much start, say once you start going well you, you you have to be on it for the sound check and make sure because it, it's no good shouting at him while you're on you know yeah and you get this is this is an important thing um, it's what me and Ralph always say is you're not listening to a record you need you put things in your wedge that on a need to know basis right so it would be nice to hear the third backing vocalist, but you know what? I really just want hi hat, bass drum, snare, bit of overheads, toms, bass, and a little touch of everything else. It's unbalanced, but it's what I need to know in order to play the music I've got. Right. And that means you have to be on it, you have to be um, polite to the monitor engineer, who is invariably not polite to you. Because really? he's got well, he's got everything else to do, isn't he? He doesn't want you going. Oh, can I have just a little bit of hi hat? <laughs> and if you know, so you have to sort of trade off. Um, so you kind of know what you want before you go in, so you can yeah. just tell him once. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And they're, they're, I mean, as long as you're polite, they're, it's all right. But I mean, you know, it, it it's a compromise, mm. and you can't be precious. Not as a bass player, you're going to make yourself really unpopular, right? If you keep moaning on about this or that and the other and I think it's quite a different skill to playing like playing live with with the monitors yeah it sounds it if you've got like you're saying different mix to what you're used to yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean I funny enough whenever we do gigs with them where there's a monitor system and uh, whoever the drummer is we'll always say can you put a bit of bass in the wedge and I, I, I always have I stand it for so long because we're not we're, I don't have a wedge sometimes you know but the drums will have a wedge yeah and I can hear his bass drum just cutting out my bass sound because I don't want to play louder. But his wedge, the, the bass drum coming out of his wedge, is cancelling my bottom end. Oh, I mean, like, you see what you mean? So he wants more bass in general? Bass, no, he wants bass drum. He wants kick oh, bass drum. Bass drum, oh, right. He, he wants kick drum yeah, yeah. in his wedge, right? And invariably, I, I always say, can you stand a bit less bass drum? Because it's just cancelling my bass now. And they're all, I mean, people are cool, you know. Yeah, um, but that's a problem for me if 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 I can't hear myself, you know. I mean, I'm used to not hearing myself how I would like it, but I try and you know EQ it so so that I'm getting what I want really. Yeah, yeah. So when you're when you're performing live, um, if we, I'm assuming were you doing a lot of it in like no charts. Uh, or... Yeah, with Tom that was yeah yeah. yeah with so... Hamish, she's no, there's no chart, and that's on pretty big can be on big stages yeah. little tiny stages you know so how do you find the, how do you find it going from like being in a, being in a session environment you've got like right. readings of massive skill and then like having it all in your head well I'm completely shit at that <laughs> right so because I've always had music in front of me um, and but 
It depends. I mean, the, the, the thing for me is I do so much, so many different things that I can't, I couldn't possibly memorise all the bands I play in. I mean, the Joni Mitchell thing is all charted mm. because I do that once a month, months, every two months. Yeah. You know, and then Hamish's gig I've been doing for 20 years, but I've still a couple of things I still use a chart for just because I haven't had time to sit down and memorise it. So it's really hard going right from right brain to left brain, I'd call it, you know, mm. reading or, or memorising. But I do some gigs where I don't use music and I love it. It's fine, yeah. you know. Do I you mean, feel like, do you have to work on that beforehand? Oh, put, yeah. Putting the groundwork. Oh, totally, sure. yeah. totally, yeah. But I'm, I mean, actually, by the time, even with charts, I'm only using them as kind of reference. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think a lot of people, I mean, I, I'm definitely guilty of, you know, if you've got a chart, your head be stuck in the chart. Yeah. Just because it's there. Yeah, yeah. Like, how yeah. do you get around that? Just. That's just what it is. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, people criticise you for doing it, but. Actually, it's everybody's got an iPad these days, haven't they? With yeah. charts and stuff, yeah, and yeah. lyrics and stuff. It doesn't look great, but you know, I don't. I have the luxury of three weeks rehearsal, hmm. or even the time. As we talked about, me working all the time. I don't time to sit down and learn an hour's set for two weeks' time. Where yeah. it's much easier for me to just write out exactly what I want. I mean, I've got a, a, upstairs. I've got stacks of music stacks of bass parts from people from years ago right because uh i mean just because i've written their parts out for them you know do you find that that's the way it happens a lot of the time is you write your own parts uh, yeah well you rewrite other people's parts so well funny enough I, I do um what i've been doing the last couple of years is they put Elvis Presley albums out with the Royal Philharmonic. Right. Ralph Ralph does them. And they take his voice off of the masters and then we re-record um, the rhythm section and they put an orchestra over. Because some of the chart, some of the tapes that they've got are live from Vegas and the plane, while it's really spirited, some of it is pretty clunky and yeah. whatever. Um so sometimes we have just got Elvis in the voice, right, in the cans. But sometimes when we did the early stuff, there's Elvis and you can hear the double bass or the bass in, from his headphones. So right. you have to play exactly what was there. Now, the first album, it was arranged by orchestral arrangers and I got a bass part and I said, this is nowhere near what was playing. So it took forever because I had to transcribe on the session. It was just me, fortunately. On the session, yeah. As well. I had to go stop, 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 stop right, right, stop, 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 and transcribe is a nightmare. So what I do now is I get booked and I write my own parts out and I get paid for that. Right? How do you, do you tell them in advance? You're like, no, the producer says, "Will you you sort it out?" I know you prefer to do that right. because the, the, and thank God we did it. I've done two other albums. Like we've done three Elvis ones now. We've done an Aretha Franklin one, and we've done a Roy Orbison one. They're coming out in uh, before the end of the year, and the Aretha Franklin one was um, all the masters were burnt in a fire, so they've only got the um, actual version. Right. Now they've got the technology now to separate the voice. They take they can take it off, but. Some of those were her singing in the room with a band. So I had to transcribe Chuck Rainey's bass lines and all sorts of people's bass lines, and that took me forever. Jeez, but yeah. it was a labour of love, and I, and I really enjoyed it. And me and Ralph nailed it in two days. We nailed, nailed all the tracks. Wow. Just That was me and him. And we, but we were policing it, coming back to what you were saying. Um, we were saying, no, it doesn't sound like that, Mike. You know, well, let's mic it like this, and the drums, you know, let's try a different snare drum to try and match it, and, yeah. and all the rest of it. So it was a really interesting project to do. Yeah. Really, really interesting. So you write your own parts for that, and then, like, any live stuff as well? Did you do your own cheat sheets, like you were saying? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. yes, definitely. With Tom, that was always the case. We always, yeah. all the whole band did their own charts. Right, okay. And we basically, Tom only ever turned up. 
for a, one evening before we went on tour. Really? Yeah, man, it's hilarious. All wow. the whole production team was there, and we'd rehearse. So we'd all write our own parts out, and we'd re- we'd have two, three days of rehearsal, and then we're out. Right. And by about the fifth gig, the lighting guys going right. I don't want to see any music stands on stage, so we'd learn it. Yeah, that because he he wanted to light it as a proper gig yeah, without yeah. music stand lights and all that. You know? Yeah. So uh, and then Tom would turn up <clears throat> the day before we went out on tour and, and he'd go right. What are we doing then? What are we doing? And I'd, we'd sing the new ones that he knew and he says we don't have to do Delilah, do we? Bloody hell! You know, all right, no, we won't do that. And then we'd just go on tour. We, I mean. Tom was amazing. He was just the most amazing yeah. to experience. We we did the production rehearsal. Then we were out on tour the next night, and he did eleven nights straight on tour. Wow! Without one off, one and then a night off, and and he he always used to say, Stevie, it's the nights off that get you, mate. Because <laughs> if he's not singing, he's in the bar, you know. So right. so uh, not so much now. I mean, I don't think he drinks now, but. Uh, we, we had such a lot of fun, yeah. man. I mean, how did that come about? Because am I right in saying you were the MD for that? I was, for, I was for after a while. Well, how that came about, this is hilarious. <laughs> right? And uh, uh, I had a band um, with Gary Wallace, who's the drummer, the drummer, who was with Pink Floyd on percussion and all that. Right. He, was a, a, he is a great friend of mine. And we had a friend, a girl singer put a band together and that's where I met Gary and we had such a laugh we used to do her showcases and we were friends of hers and we used to do all the poxy little showcases all around London where like amateur bands would turn up and we we just went out and we got on a band and we hired gear and all that we had the best laugh ever no money we had the best laugh ever and she could never get us together never never we were not we were very disciplined when we played, mm. but getting us together and, and stop stopping messing about was impossible. So she said, "You are such a load of nowhere." So that was the name of the band, really? the, the NWCs. Yes, <laughs> and, and in the, uh, so that was the band, and then Dave Gilmore had put together um, a charity concert uh, called Curd Aid. It was when there was some terrible family things of war over there and Tom came on and Gary was the MD put the band together with Dave Newman he sorted it all out made friends with Tom and Tom got a TV show in 1992 called The Right Time and Guy Pratt who played bass on the um, concert was away with I can't remember Robert Palmer or somebody so I got booked to do the TV show and it was that band the Nowhere turned up the NWCs and we played with Stevie Wonder Al Jarreau uh, Cindy Lauper uh, oh Christ every, it was a fantastic time six weeks up in wow. Nottingham yeah. we had a brilliant 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 time and at the end of the TV series Mark Tom's son said we're doing Glastonbury it went fantastic. So we rehearsed Tom's set, wrote all our parts out, and we did a 45-minute Otis Redding Stacks um, set with Tom at, at Glastonbury, and that was it. And, and we went on tour with him, and then we were his band, English band. He had a British, uh, an American band that played all the casinos and Vegas and all that business over there. And then when he came over here, we'd go out and tour with him, which was kind of every other year. Oh, right. So... It was fantastic. And then Gary went off with Pink Floyd again. And I I was the MD for five, six years. Right. So what does being the MD of something like uh, Well, getting involved? shit from everybody, frankly. Right. <laughs> but I didn't like it at all. I didn't like, I didn't like it being it. But I, it, it fell to me. No one else, everyone else was so nowhere. <laughs> that I'd, I'd stepped up to the plate. And yeah, I mean, it was like getting people together, getting the teams together. I mean, it was it basically it was I was just the MD meant I was the sort of person in, in supposedly in charge of the band. But I mean, right. you know, Ian Thomas wrote, wrote he um, 
counted everything in because he had a click. I'd do a bit of waving around if it was slowing down or speeding up. Um, and then we just went out and did our own part. So, I mean, yeah, I was kind of the MD. I mean, I, I, there was a couple of the TV shows where I was MDing. I was actually conducting and stuff like that. Right. But like not, not playing like actually. Yeah, no, I was like playing as well. Playing I was always, always playing, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I don't think I know many bass MD. I mean, is that a. Uh, I don't know. Thing, I think or? Shaka Khan was as a bass MD. Right. Uh, the MD for Steely Dan is, a, is the bass player, isn't he? Tom Barney, I think. Right. Um, I don't know about that. I don't know. I, I mean, as I say, I was. It, it was. Yeah, I was the MD, but I mean, you know. Yeah. We just got on the bus and went and had a laugh, you know. So it wasn't it wasn't like too much more, but did you have to then have conversations with like the team or Tom Jones? Or yeah, I hired like... I hired the band as well because I mean basically it was most of the NWCs, but um, I I had to hire and fire people right. sometimes, so that was my responsibility too. So you did have some not so nice things to take care of yeah very much so I did I hated it I hated it in fact I didn't I, I ended up I, I stopped doing it I could have been doing it for longer but I, I just had enough mm. and what, does know. that mean you left the gig or you just I did it? leave the gig yeah. right yeah really yeah that's, that's alright yeah it sounds stressful actually like yeah so I, mean, I didn't it doesn't suit me because the thing anyway. is everybody thinks you're getting loads more money than them and that you're doing them out of money and that every moan they come and moan at you and musicians moan I right. know because I moan <laughs> so and I didn't like it doesn't suit me some people it suits it didn't suit me at all no. right so uh, are you glad you did it though just to um, have done it in the uh, well I, the, I don't think I would have been doing the gig if I didn't take on the MDs I, I'd love right. to have just been the bass player I'd love that I would have loved and I'll never be I'll never ever be an anybody's MD ever again right uh, no, I'm not interested um, I, you know, I didn't get into it I don't I don't like that responsibility I don't like how you're perceived by your fellow musician and right. I don't I don't like that I, that's I'm part of I just want to play the bass really yeah. you know so I guess it was a good experience then, because now you know you never want to... Well, I guess that, but yeah, you could say that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's kind of passively, aggressively a good uh, way of putting it. But no, I, no I, I, other people do that better. Yeah. You know? mm. So going back a little bit to what you were saying there, like you touched on it, but I have to ask, like when you played with all the people, like Stevie Wonder, yeah. just for my own... like personal how how was it to play with him like, okay well that that tv series was an amazing uh forward momentum for me hmm. because it was the first big gig i i uh, first big tv show where it was like pop things it wasn't sitting in the, in the orchestra playing behind somebody right. we were the band we were all of us on on stage getting our own we had a day's rehearsal we had, and then the artists came in and and we vibed with them and we it was fantastic it was an absolutely fantastic series and i think we did the first couple of shows misha paris came on i think which was great and then al Jarreau was going to come on who i've been a fan of since i was 16 mm. 17 and I remember we were waiting for him to come in the studio and I was really, ner really nervous, but excited, so excited to be playing with this person who I absolutely loved his music, got all his albums and everything. Yeah. And um, we did it and he was, he was cool. He actually gave it, he roasted us a bit actually because we were playing his new single and he came in and he... Um, he said, okay, uh, have, you, have you got it together? And we went, yeah. And he bought Neil Larson, a fantastic piano player, as his MD. Okay, let's hear it. So we do the intro. And he didn't sing. He just sat there, like, he sat there with all his, like, his hand in hand in chin, you know, hand under his chin. And we finished it. And he went, okay, play it again. <laughs> and he sat there again, <laughs> didn't see. And then he said, "Great, and let's let's do it." And then he got up and he was as nice as pie. But right. it was like a, it was a bit of a That's, sounds strange. It, yeah, he, he was. He wasn't. He wasn't being. He wasn't trying to vibe us out. He was just going. 
we're going to do this properly or or not. Right. You know what I mean? And anyway, we came through that, and I thought, God, I've just done a really fantastic gig. I've, my confidence went through the roof, and I thought, I don't have to be quite so scared anymore. Right. Do you know what I mean? I've so actually. You, know you can hold it yeah, your own. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're going and playing with people who you who have albums of and 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 are, are, are massively. I mean, I'd done Van Morrison and all that, but I, I wasn't a Van Morrison fan beforehand. But to, to play with somebody like that, with that sort of music, sort of funk music, which is my love, really. Mm. And then, of course, two weeks later, they said we've got Stevie Wonder on the show. We went fuck <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's a good job I'd had the uh, confidence of Al Jarreau a yeah. couple, of day, couple of weeks beforehand, you know. And they put us in a coach and we went to Birmingham to watch his show and we'd been doing, we'd been playing I Wish and Do I Do in the band, with our band anyway. Mm. Anyway, he came in and we played Superstition with him and it was an amazing day, amazing to be in the same studio. And Tom, I mean, Tom... Tom's up there, man, with Stevie Wonder. I mean, he's not an art, a writer or anything, but he's he's a legend, you know. Yeah, Tom. absolutely, absolutely. And and that's a long time ago. He was my age. He was fifty. No, I mean, fifty-two. So he's younger than I am now. When I first started working with him, and he was top of his game, you know. And, and I mean, him and Stevie, they'd sung together in year for years. Anyway, they loved each other, and it's just yeah. been in a room with them. It's a, Incredible, you know. Amazing. It was amazing. It was, and it's of course it's on TV. I don't know if you can get it on YouTube anymore, but I'm uh, sure it's probably out there somewhere. Yeah, else. yeah. It's it was pretty happening. I mean, I I look. I'm having the best time of my life with when the camera goes on me. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course you know, and then Daryl Hall came on and Sam Moore, and we did oh, all sorts of things. And of course, then you take that on, don't you? Into your you you have that in your bag of confidence and experience. Yeah. Um, that you can uh, exist um, with those people, and you have you are able to. And I mean, I, I, ne I never beat myself up about it. But you know, if I would, if I was Will Lee in the seventies, I'd be doing like he does because he was around then. You know, I, I mean, I'm just a geezer from Itchin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Who tries to carve a little funky career for, out for himself. Yeah. And, and so I just do the best with what I, comes towards me and try and make it as vibey as I possibly can, mm. you know. And that was a little chance to do that. I mean, not long after that. In fact, the year after, I, I, I ended up working with Steve Gadd for a day. It was just the most amazing experience. But I took God, yeah. just up the road here, actually, in, in Wood Green, of all places. <laughs> I did ben, ben and Tracy, everything but the girl. I did two singles with them, and they flew him over, especially. It was just me, him, and Ben on guitar, and Tracy singing. Wow. And Phil Ramone producing. So it was a, that was an immense day, you know. Yeah, what's That's, Steve like? Oh, he's lovely, man. I mean, yeah, I said, I went up to him at the end, and I said... That's just been the greatest pleasure for me, man, playing with you. And he went, oh, you're easy to play with. It's fine, you know. <laughs> it was just so lovely. It was great. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, that's another one in your experience bag. So you, you go, hey, my groove must be okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? And so when things happen where you don't feel particularly groovy, you don't immediately think it's you. It, right. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like... There's some. Other, there might be some other reason. Not that you're looking to blame anyone, but it means that you're sure in what you played. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so you can come from a, peer, uh, a place of confidence in order to try and make it better. Whatever's yeah. not happening. And I'm sure yeah. that that you feel like you play better because you have more confidence. Yeah. 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 So yeah. You're you, not. Yeah. You're not yeah. scared to go for things. Yes. So much. Or yeah. Like, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I've been extremely fortunate to um, play with my hero drum, drummers, you know. Um, I did a day with Chester Thompson yeah. uh, for a film. That was great. Peter Erskine, great. Amazing. Great. Play. I did a big band gig with him at Ronnie's for Seth MacFarlane, you know, the grand family yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did two, oh, shows, wow. two shows there. It was brilliant, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. And Pete, Pete's such a lovely man. He's so, I, I saw him a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was great. Is that like is that like a common thing between all these people, like um, Stevie, Gad, Erskine, yeah. whatever? Are they just, 
as well as being amazing at what they do, obviously. Yeah. Are they like just genuinely nice people to hang out with as well? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say I didn't hang out with Stevie because he just came in with his entourage, sang a song, and then a couple of things and was interviewed and buggered off. I mean, that was more just my personal being on the same stage as him. Right. Yeah. That, that was like that. But I mean. But the other guys that you know. Well, Steve Gab was just sweet, a sweetness itself. Chester Thompson was lovely. Peter Erskine, fantastic. Yeah. You know, just geezers, really, just like me and you. I mean, Peter Erskine's the most down to earth person ever. Right. You know, he loves English beer and, and <laughs> hanging out with the guys. You know, he's been over here an awful lot. Yeah. And, um, but then you sort of go, you go, hey, I mean, I saw him at Ronnie's. He came up to me and said, hey, Steve, man, how you doing? And I'm going, oh, I'm all right, yeah, yeah. And then I put weather report on the, on the CD on the way over. And I'm going, what the? <laughs> you know, I mean, he's a, he's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. He was, he was amazing that, on that gig. I mean, I do the, I play in the Ronnie Scott's big band. Um, <laughs> And he sat in the middle of us, and he, he literally he commanded all the whole time on the stage, and all he did was play from a lot of the night. He just played four crotches on the ride cymbal. It was just the best thing to play bass to. Right. It was amazing the energy and the and the gravitas that was was put into it was lovely. You know, yeah. absolutely lovely. Do you find with stuff like that, like, the simpler the better with certain things, or is it just the way that know. he did it? I don't, no, I think, I think it, his authority is what it right. was. He stamped, he came in and just, he didn't play anything flash at all, mm. but the authority with what he stamped the groove on, you know, I mean, I'm a big, big band fan, because my dad, the, one of the other things, what he, he did do, his greatest achievement in his life, is he ran a big band for 30 years, right. which I played in from the time I was 18 until he died. Um, and I'm, in my mum's garage, I've got 400 big band arrangements that he arranged and copied himself. Wow. Um, so I'm a pretty huge big band fan. I've played in big bands all my life, and I was in the National East Jazz Orchestra as well. So, oh, you and Nigel too. Yeah, that, that everybody seems to go. Through, yeah, yeah, has yeah. Gone through that at yeah. some point. I, that was a long time. Nineteen eighty one. I was in that. So, yeah, I met my wife. I met all my friends in there. <laughs> everybody, really, you know. Mm. So that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. But yeah, he, and to play in a band that I'm used to playing in, Ronnie Scott's big band, and have Peter Erskine sit in the middle of us. And stamp his authority on it. it was that was nice? That yeah. was a nice thing. Amazing. So yeah. they're all talking about people that you know from records or whatever. Um, you played with Herbie and Wayne as well. I did. Oh, that was by uh, Vinny was on drums on that. So really? Wow. Uh, um, yeah, that was that was weird. <laughs> that was <laughs> what weird. Was it, what was that about? Well, it was um, live from Abbey Road, the TV show. A really excellent, high end kind of sort of like Jules Holland, but with pedigree because it's beautifully recorded on multi-track and right. it's mixed and people come in and it's lit properly and you know performance at Abbey Road Studio One and I was walking I was in Trafalgar Square I remember the phone went and Peter Van Hook who is a drummer he used to be with Van uh, but he's a producer a record producer and I worked for him do sessions for him and he said Steve Pete Van Hook hello mate um, I've got a gig for you Herbie Hancock Wayne Shaw I went what? <laughs> on double bass I went no 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 <laughs> no I said I'm not like that I can't play like that and he said no no it's not, it's not a jazz gig it's not a jazz gig it's, it's, he's done an album of Joni Mitchell tunes and it's pop double bass really you know and I went fucking hell Pete I don't know where I feel, how I feel about that he said, no, you'll be fine. You're perfect. You're perfect for it. So it was. It was Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock. And at that time, it was, uh, when I got booked, it was Neil Wilkinson on drums. Right. And we were playing with Melody Gardo, the singer, and another singer, I can't remember her name. Um, and it got nearer the time. And Pete said, Pete phoned me up and went, uh, it's a change of plan. And I said, oh, what, you don't want me to do it? He said, oh, no, you're doing it. He says, but it's Vinnie Collier who are on drums. <laughs> I went, fantastic. Okay, so then I shat myself, you know, got the album, transcribed the charts. 
and all the rest of it, and absolutely was so frightened, so so frightened, so nervous. I thought, what? They do a version of Nefertiti on there. It's like, oh my god, what the fuck am I doing? So I turned up on the day, and Vinny's beautiful, lovely geezer, um, and Herbie and Wayne walk in, and and there's like, well, I've got the photographs up there. That's the day. Um, it's um, they were gracious men, and we started playing. And I thought I don't have to be nervous because they don't care about that. You just you've got to play the bass, and they were that's nothing difficult. It wasn't tear ass jazz. It was tunes, you know, pop tunes. I played Edith and the Kingpin, um, and a couple of other tunes, I think which didn't make it to the TV show. And it, they were just, their vibe was so welcoming to me. Yeah. And, and they, weren't interest, they, they weren't interested in that I'd never played with them before. They just were serving the music, totally serving the music. And uh, it, Abbey Road Studio One, have you been there? No. All right, it's this massive, massive place, right? <clears throat> and, I mean, you know, it's a big, big room. But you don't realise until it goes silent for the start of a track take. I've been there many, many times for many years. The silence is unbelievable because it's you're in a huge place that's treated acoustically and so there's no sound. It's like being in a vacuum. And Herbie said, OK, uh, I'm going to uh, play a little intro here and then I'm going to nod you in, Steve. And I went, OK, <laughs> OK. <laughs> And he goes, okay, shall we go for one? And he goes, yeah. So then the silence came in. And there must have been 40 people, uh, technicians and film crew and lighting, and us in the middle. And there's Vinnie on my right, and there's Wayne Shorter looking at me at 10 feet away, and Herbie over there on his enormous piano, and Mitch Dorton on guitar. And he goes, okay, okay, are you ready? And they go, the, the box said, yeah, we're ready. And then there's this silence happened, and I looked across and Herbie's just sitting there with his hands together for what felt like ages. And he picks his, his figures up and he starts playing and it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, Christ. It's like, I've got all, I'm a Mars Davis nut, right? So Herbie, it, to me, that, that quintet with Herbie and Wayne and uh, Tony Williams and Ron Carter, mm. come on, you know. And he played this intro, this beautiful intro. And he just looked over and nodded me, and I went, bong, bottom F. And it was, it just went, whoosh. Vinny started the most exquisite little groove going. I think we did two takes of it. And I just, it was just the most incredible thing to be in amongst that energy. You know, fucking hell, man. Amazing, excuse me. That was absolutely amazing. I felt part of the music, part of... I felt that I contributed to it. I didn't play anything really. It was just what was needed, you know. And uh, Wayne Short came up to me at the end. He went, "You get a big round sound out of that thing. I like it." I went, "Whoa, okay. <laughs> I love that man. You know, I'm, I'm I'm a fan as much as a muso, really. You know." Yeah. So uh, no, it was a special day. And I said to I said to Vinny, we were talking afterwards. I said, "Fucking hell, Vinny." I said, "That was just amazing." He says. I know, he said, I've just been on tour with Herbie, he says, and one night I stopped playing because I looked across and I thought, fuck, that's Herbie Hancock. <laughs> so even he was, even he gets it, you know. Yeah. Like, and I, he said, don't worry about it, man. He says, that's, that's happened to me. He says, but just, yeah, he was nice, nice. Man, that's nice incredible. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, good day, really good day. Jesus. And that all just came about, it just, just happened somehow. Well, I mean, it's just because I'd, I'd worked with P Pete Van Hook and he, he didn't want a jazz bass player because it was a pop tune. Hmm. And uh, they wouldn't pay for Dave Holland to fly over. Right. Universal wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> so they didn't have a bass player. <laughs> Here I was, you know. I got it by default, fortunately, but great, yeah. man. Great day for me. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I could have, I would have preferred to do it on bass guitar, 
because double bass is not my first instrument, but hey, you know. Well, sounds like you did all right. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah it, was, it was pretty straightforward. It was, it was more about keeping my nerve, really. Mm. I mean, I, in fact, that's probably the scariest thing I've ever done, right. without, without any doubt. I mean, I had to use every ounce of experience, every ounce of experience mm. to get to not just break down and sob. <laughs> and go home, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, it's funny because uh, uh, going back to the Steve Gadd session I did, um, which was up the road in at Livingston Studios in Wood Green, and uh, I lived even nearer then you know, in East Fitchley. And as I was dry, <laughs> driving there, uh, there's a roundabout, and I just started laughing. I started pissing myself laughing because of the enormity of what I was about to do to go and play with Steve Gadd. And uh, there's this roundabout, and I thought, well, you can either go round the roundabout and straight on to the studio, or you can turn round the roundabout and go home. And if you go home, that's your choosing now. But if you go straight on, you're going to have to bring something to this session. You're not going to go there and be a blubbering mess and a nervous wreck. Mm. You're just you're going to be you got to go and play the music and and be the bass player. Because nobody else is interested in how nervous you are, you know. They want you to play the bass, and you've been chosen to do that. Yeah. Which so that again, it was me bringing some kind of strength out, fortitude out mm. of my, myself, and using my experience. And of course, I came through the other end um, reasonably successfully. Yeah. You know, that seems to be the, th- the thing you're saying about everything and everything you've done. Once you start, once you get the contacts and whatever. Yeah. If you do something and then you do a good job on it, you're, yeah. you're only going to go up from yeah. there. Like stuff's only going to open up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think the work comes, which you don't get any thanks for, is that trying to second guess what might be needed of you. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? So if there's, you know, I can play with a plectrum. Some bass players don't ever pick up a pick. Mm. And I p- play with the plectrum, and some people are surprised when I play it, and pleasantly surprised, you know. And so that occurs to me to have that in my arsenal. Yeah. So I guess the the playing bit is the enjoyable bit. The hard work bit is is listening to that record and this, that, and the other. What I was going to say to you early on is about playing the double bass. The fortune, the great fortune I had. <clears throat> it's in 1996, around that time, Nora Jones had a massive hit album and a hit single, and it was a pop record with a nice tinkly piano, and it was double bass. And the industry caught hold of this, and everybody wanted double bass on their record. Right. And what happened was, for a little while, they booked jazz double bass players who turned up with... A terrible double bass sound, which is you know a jazz double bass sound, but without it either rattled their double bass rattled or buzzed or whatever. Secondly, they didn't play in tune, and thirdly, they were bored shitless at playing a pop tune on double bass. Yeah. I'm not saying all of them, and I'm certainly and I can't really name names. All I know is that I played in tune with a good sound, ta- with a good sound, and I know how to play pop bass yeah. so I completely cleaned up really right. because anybody who wanted everybody wanted it double bass was in pop on pop records for the first time in you know off from that Nora Jones record mm. and I did untold sessions jingles little TV shows da, 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 and that's what really I was very lucky there in, 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 timing wise you know what I mean yeah because it suited how I played to play pop double bass. Yeah. Did you already have double bass before that? Yeah, well, I just started learning. I just started learning. Really good timing then. Yeah, really good timing. And actually, when I got that double bass, I decided I'm going to do it as a hobby. And I went to a classical teacher um, to teach me to play with a bow Mm. marker. And I I told lots of people I was doing it, and I, I, I never, ever thought I'd be doing it playing it 
And then one day I got a call from Pete Murray who said, um, are you working this afternoon? I said, no. He said, come and play du- double bass on Barbara Windsor's album. <laughs> I went, really? He went, yeah, 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 you'll be fine. Cause, and, and there I was, I was in. I was I was in the business as a double bass player right. all of a sudden. Of course, no one's let me get away. I, I, what was supposed to be a lovely hobby, which I was learning every week, going to have a little lesson and yeah. practicing and all the rest of it, I didn't really think I was going to apply it professionally, you know. And then, of course, it's I've, I've been scared stiff ever since, really, you know, because <laughs> it's another whole instrument entirely, yeah. really. But uh, I enjoy it, so it's good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Extra thing to be able to do it is yeah well I mean the show that I just finished in the West End was playing both right uh, yeah. that's a big thing with shows as well isn't it like, yeah doubling yeah. yeah and then so I take you would advise people to if to, to be able to make a living out of it I suppose you should, as a bass player I, yeah yeah and then also yeah. Transcribes to everything else yep. as well that other musicians do, like being able to turn your hands to different things. So that adapt you can... or die is the is the uh, thing. Right, yeah. right, good phrase. Um, so with the session stuff, yeah. Do you feel like that because there's there's a bit less of it these days, obviously. Yep. Do you think it's still a way that musician musicians can still earn some of their living through that these days if they're coming up from younger? I think that there will always be a need for a studio musician Mm. and when my time is over and I mean the guy I work for on Saturday I've worked for him for 30 years and he hardly does anything now right but this was for a big Italian he used to do all the Oasis um, singles string he's a string writer yeah Nick Ingman his name he's a lovely man and we've done so many things together over the years he did all the everything with the girl things Mm. yeah Oh, countless, countless things. But he hardly works at all. And there, I work for the new lot of string arrangers. But there is, but there's young bass players who are fine, fine players. Mm. They're doing their own little bit of recording. You know, I see on Facebook that they're in the studios I go in. So you work for who you work for in your lifetime, yeah. really. And may there be enough work for everybody. I mean, it's not like... The old days where, like fixers used to phone up and say they they were given right. I've got a twenty piece orchestra, with bass guitar, two guitars, keyboards, bass, drums, and then they'd phone me. There are sometimes like that. Isabel phones me for sessions where she's just asked for a bass guitar player, but right. invariably she gets booked by people who want me. Do you know what I mean? Because I've worked from for years and everything. years, and, yeah. you know, but. There are other must be younger players that are building their own reputation mm. somewhere, you know. Do you feel like there's any sort of route into the studios? Well, the thing is, well, this is something I when I have I've only done it a few times, but go and talk to younger pl- bass players at a college or something, mm. and uh, they all say, "How do you get into sessions?" And I said, "Well, you're not going to do the sessions I do because I do them." Yeah. Um, but you know. The little geeky guy playing synths in the room down the corridor that you'll take the piss out of in the canteen. He's go and play bass on his demo. Go and say you want to play bass on it uh, because he's going to write the soundtrack. He's going to write a TV show. He's going to MD this. He's going to be in the theatre. He's going to do that because he's a keyboard player or he's going to make little records. He's going to produce a record and he's going to want a bass guitar player and that's who you're going to be doing sessions and that is your way in. You see what I mean? Yeah. So then when you're in, you then meet people through that. And totally, like, yeah. totally. I mean, that's, uh, I, you know, I can't stress highly enough that, is that your peer group is where you are going to find your session work. And none of you are doing sessions now because everybody's still using old bastards like me. You know, and then the old guy, I mean, as I say, Steve Sibble, I've known him when we were in Niger together. His brother, Neil, worked for him, sessions. Dave Arch was in, set, was in Niger with him. You know, I, these are these are just the people I've worked in in yeah. the last five weeks or something. It's just know. a generation. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's our generation, and we took over from the really old guys, the Jack Parnell, uh, the Muppet Show. They did all that. That who were all in the Ted Heath Orchestra in the fifties, right. in the forties and fifties. They went and did all the TV and all the session work all the way up to sort of about nineteen eighty one, and. 
there was a TV show called Entertainment Express and they wanted a young band and they cut all the old guys out and all of our lot from Nigel all did it and they've never they were all been in the studios ever since right that was a lucky break for those guys mm. I didn't do it I, I wasn't on that show but um, uh, I ended up coming in from slightly well they got in and then they got me in <laughs> so it was a generational thing you know I mean that there was recent Adam Goldsmith was in the um, X Factor big band which went out on tour Right. A lot of the younger players on that, it's a generation after me, mm. they, I see them in the studio. So, you know, I think, well, I mean, someone like Adam, he's fine, as fine a guitar player this, as this country has ever produced. And fantastic player, you know, he's got a place anywhere in any studio setting. Yeah. You know, but he's very bright and he's very talented and, and gives a shit about his banjo playing. You know, and things that are boring, he eats it and wants to do it. You know, he, as we were saying, if you're going to moan about driving to Manchester and back, this business may not be for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, what if you? What advice would you give to someone who's, if they if they're in like my position, just finished college? Yeah. Going out, want to become a musician, or like like yourself? Yeah bit younger just just wanting to start like what advice would you give them for well now? I'd, I'd first of all i'd say go and play whenever you can with whoever you can right um and it will be a very soul destroying thing because you'll play with people who, who you're not going to learn anything of apart from never do it again <laughs> right but you know i mean you have to go out and be noticed but without being pushy because that's something i have noticed about young college people people have Facebook me and message me and emailed me and and are too pushy man you know it's like we all smell that a mile right. off, you know where's the line then because oh, I, mean, I don't like, know like I... yourself you said you went and like you just went and sat in the studio I is, did is, is that do you think well, that's still a thing well I wasn't people... pushy at all right I was I was humble respectful um I wasn't cocky I I looked I I wanted to learn really badly wanted to learn and but I never went with the thought that I want your gig right. or can you get me a gig Do you never that's an issue with people these days I th- well certain people yeah I mean funny enough when I was sitting in the show I used to get messages from people all the time can I come sit I think I ought to come and see your show and I could get sniff it from like just a text just or the something. way they wrote it yeah and it's like so there was there's one or two people were just so nice and I could, the energy I got from their text or message or whatever, I thought, yeah, come in, man, come yeah. in. And, you know, some, one or two, I was wrong. I mean, one or two were on their phone while I was playing. I thought, you ain't going to make this, mate, because, mm-hmm. you know, this is, if you don't know what I have to do eight shows a week and take that on board, you're not mm-hmm. going to, you know. Yeah. If you're going to get bored, you you are going to get bored. You're going to, you know what I mean? It's like, but some turn up. I mean, and I always turn and say, "Was that have any help to you?" And and they go, "Well, that was amazing." Yeah, I said, and I always try and say, "Look, I'll play this part here, and it will be something real simple." And I say, "Check it out, right?" Because I'll play it here on the neck, and I'll go, I'll slide to here because that's a nice warmer sound. And if you go from here and slide to there. These things bother me, right. and this is what makes a great bass line. You know, if you want to know about that, that's I'm your boy. If you want to know how to sight read or how to play really fast or whatever, don't come see me because <laughs> sight reading is just a language. Sit down, get your books out. Look, you're right across there, there's my the two pages I have open this morning. Mm. You know, sight reading, it's just keep just doing it, doing don't it, you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's no magic thing, you know, but. As I say, it occurs to me to worry about how long that minimum should really be, even though it's a minimum, you know. Yeah, yeah. It it occurs to me that that when I've got a a two-bar pattern, that each one of those two bars sounds even. Absolutely. Each note sounds even, and each time I play it sounds even. And if I choose to to open out the sound and make the notes a little bit longer, to, to push it into the middle eight, then that's what has occurred to me. 
if that doesn't is that occur to you, decision? yeah, it totally yeah. is. It totally is. And, and if you go back and listen to records, the records I love, it didn't occur to those players because they are genius, natural players. Right. Right. So when you hear Chuck Roney playing whatever, um, it comes completely naturally to him. But it's not, I'm a white boy from Hitchin, Hertfordshire, right? So I have to analyse, take it in, and then make a conscious decision. Mm. I'm not saying Chuck Rennie's never made a conscious decision, and he just plays it out. Because yeah. if you, if actually, if you listen to uh, interviews, read interviews with him, he's very much like that. Because he's gone the journey that I've gone, which is learning about how your bass sounds, how it, how it sounds recorded-wise, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, that's I don't know, I don't I don't know whether they teach that in colleges. I have no idea, but that's been that's why I get booked. Yeah, without a doubt, you know. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Mm. Right. Should we finish with a few quick questions Go on about in. things? So, yeah. uh, in terms of gear, is there anything that you use the majority of the time, or like standard thing you think people should have as a bass player? Uh, well, I have a Sadowski five string, right? Which is my chosen five string, fantastic bass. Um, it doesn't buzz. It doesn't buzz electronically. The frets don't buzz. The strings are even. They play. It plays in tune all over the neck. Uh, my leads are not. Do not go duff in the middle of a session. And if one does, I have at least two spares. Right. Uh, it goes into a Sansamp DI box, which is every bass guitar I have goes into one of those. And I use that as a DI box over 99, no, all of the sets, every studio, whether it be Abbey Road or someone's front room. It will, my bass will go into a Sansamp and then will go straight into the desk. Right. Um, all the engineers in all of the studios are more all happy with the sound that I give them um, I've got a, uh, a variety of fenders precision with round wound strings for rock stuff I've got a fender precision with flat wound strings on with, with foam under the bridge for the Motown sort of sound I've got five string fretless uh, a five string fretless I've got an acoustic bass guitar I've got um, I've got various other things that make various other bass sounds that maybe or maybe not anyone notices the difference because right. people say you just sound the same on everything <laughs> but I'm not having that because sometimes people hear with their eyes mm. and if you bring in an old Fender to certain people that go, hey, that's an old old Fender, right? I went, yes, yeah, it's a 76. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, it does sound great, <laughs> but he's looked at it first. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it's clunky and it's 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 knocked about and all that, you know. Mm. So I have those. That's what I take in. I've got a, 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 va a very nice old Ampeg valve amp, bass amp, which sounds amazing with a mic in front of it. People are asking for that more and more. My double bass doesn't buzz. It is even all over. It's got a fantastic pickup on it should you need to use that. I've also got my own microphone. And I turn up very, very early and everybody's happy right, <laughs> to really? see me. You hopefully. use your own microphone. Well, I can, I, I have, it's on there. I mean, oh, you pick I, up on the bass? I've got a pick up, but I've also got a, 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 a quite a nice mic, a, oh, a DPA okay. 420, which sounds really good it doesn't sound like a lovely old um, valve mic which I get in the big studios mm. but I like the fact that when I take my double bass out I go would you like to use my microphone because sometimes studios don't have they don't even know how to mic a double bass up Yeah. so I'm taking away any worry anyone should have yeah. About me plugging in. Mm. You know what I mean? How did you get all of the stuff to do, like knowing different mics, how they sound? Is that just from purely being in the studio? Well, you know what? I leave the miking of a double bass to the engineer. But um, you're saying you can tell the difference between them all? Yeah, well, the reason I put one on my bass is because I know that sounds great mm. if 
theirs doesn't sound great. Right. So it's obvious to you if theirs is a bit y- yeah. Dark. Or they yeah, and I know where to put the microphone. But uh, having said that, some engineers put their mic in a different place, and it still sounds good. Right. So it's again, it's knowledge and experience of it. Um, that uh, that's my equipment anyway. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's my. This is possibly the hardest question to ask anyone. Right. Do, th- do you have any recommended listening for people? For what instrument? For bass? Absolutely anyone. Can do bass if you want, but like just okay. literally anything, like somewhere to start or like. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I mean, my it com- it has to be down to personal taste in music, but I'm kind of an old soul R and B person. Marvin Gaye, Donny Hathaway. Stevie, um, all the way through that, or from Aretha, Chaka Khan. That's yeah. what I grew up with. Do you have any favourite albums from any of them in particular, or is it just? Uh, well, there's hundreds of them. There's hundreds. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the early, uh, early Chaka Khan, uh, all the Aretha albums. This, this just, just fantastic rhythm section playing on all those. The Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Come on, you know, mm. Jameson. Bob Babbitt plays on that, uh, Chuck Rainey, you know, going through that. And then I went through a whole stage of Marcus Miller, Anthony Jackson, you know, this is just my instrument. Um, and then you go back and find people like um, Paul Jackson out of the Headhunters, amazing, a unique player. I put it up, I'd steal shit from him um, and put it all in the pot, you know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, I, yeah. That that will do, but my my male, the thing that does my head in is Miles Davis, you know, of which all of that, well, Marcus Miller played with him, you know, Ma- Michael Henderson who was in his electric band, not not at to everyone's cup of tea, all the different phases of Miles Davis, but I love everything, I forgive him for right. all manner of things, including <laughs> his ridiculous hair in the late nineties when he had a weave and all that. It's just Miles. I saw him many times live. Right. And uh it's a religious experience for me, you know. So uh that's my thing really. Great. You know. Yeah. Okay. So last thing, is there anywhere that people can see you play? Um, Here you do your thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I play at the 606. I play at uh, that place, Boaters in Kingston. I play at Ronnie's. I play... I'm playing up the road here at the Woodman in Highgate in a couple of weeks with Adam's band, Adam mm-hmm. Goldsmith's band. All over, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of... Wherever. <laughs> <laughs> if, anyone wants to, if anyone wants to book me, I'll go and play, you know. I, yeah. love, I love playing in pubs. I love it. I've always done it. And uh, the what, the Woodman up next to Highgate Tube is a fantastic... I'm going tonight, actually. Uh, Ian Thomas is playing there. Right. Um, it's free to get in. It's fantastic band. It's a great band. Paul Stacey on guitar. Um yeah, there's little venues. I mean, yeah, that's where I play. Yeah, great. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Look, I've talked about myself for two and three quarter hours. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's well, been good great, luck, though. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Good, man. Good. good. Hearing everything You're, about. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Tom Hutch podcast. I really appreciate you giving your time to listen. Uh, I really enjoyed this talk with Steve and I hope you did as well. Steve doesn't have a lot of social media presence, but he has conducted a few other interviews. So if you type that into Google, you'll be able to find them there. And if you want to check out the show notes, then you can head over to tomhutchmusic.com forward slash podcast and find it all there. If you like this episode, please, I'd appreciate it if you shared it with someone else who you think would enjoy it. And if you have any ideas of guests that you'd like to hear from or questions you would like me to ask, then please get in touch with me personally by email at tlhutchmusic at gmail.com or on social media at tlhutchmusic. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you in the next one.